Gelding here on Capitol Hill for today's hearing of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Energy and Power. The subcommittee, chaired by Democratic Congressman John Dingell of Michigan, met this morning to examine U.S. energy policy and U.S. energy reserves in light of the ongoing Persian Gulf conflict. A number of witnesses appeared before the committee, including representatives of the petroleum industry, the Department of Energy, and the financial community. The committee will come to order. The chair announces that uh, because of the uh, important situation in the Gulf and also because of the difficulties that the committee is having in terms of getting its members together to uh, commence its organizational proce processes, we are choosing the device of being briefed by uh, the Honorable John J. Easton. Assistant Secretary for International Affairs and Energy Emergencies at the Department of Energy, and others who will appear here before us this morning to discuss the situation that confronts us. The Chair wants to express uh, my personal gratitude and that of the members of the committee to all who are here to assist us today in understanding the energy aspects of the situation before us. It had been the hope of the Chair that uh, this matter could have been conducted by the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, uh, Mr. Sharp who was and will be the chairman of our uh, committee on, uh, subcommittee on energy and power. Uh, and the chair will uh, defer to the distinguished gentleman from Indiana because of his very immediate and direct responsibilities in the matters into which we are now inquiring. It is the hope that uh, the uh, meeting today and the information gathered will be of assistance not only to the members of the committee, the Congress, but also the uh, country at large in terms of arriving at, at some of the important decisions that we're going to have to make with regard to the actions of this country in the Persian Gulf. There are many serious considerations in these decisions, the foremost being the lives of those in the military protecting the interests of the United States. Today's briefing, however, does focus on an area of concern specifically of responsibility of this committee, the energy implications of the Persian Gulf situation. The chair and the committee will inquire into how the Persian Gulf situation has affected the energy market and the, uh, and the economy so far. How, uh, what and how could adverse effects have been uh, less, uh, lessened? Uh, the committee is going to inquire into whether we are ready for the domestic impact of a war in the Persian Gulf, particularly with regard to energy prices. And uh, the chair and the committee are going to inquire into what would an armed conflict mean for the energy market and the economy. And of course, we will be interested to know what can be done to mitigate or to moderate expected adverse consequences. And of course, what will be those consequences. Many believe the Persian Gulf situation precipitated the current recession. And those of us who were in the Congress in the 70s will remember the, the dire consequences of the Arab oil embargoes and the other oil shutoffs which occurred in the 70s and early 80s. And we can, we can understand that the situation then uh, with regard to economic downturn following from oil shutoffs and huge aberrations in oil supplies is not a surprising thing. According to figures from the Energy Information Administration, the price of crude oil on the world market went from a low in June of $13 per barrel to a high in September of $36 per barrel. Thus, at the peak, increased oil prices not only almost tripled, but eliminated the equivalent of almost 2 percent of the gross national product of the United States on an annualized basis, a very serious economic consequence which uh, is going to be observed in its impact for some time to come. These incre increases have since moderated, but damage to consumers and to the economy of the United States has already been done. The possibility of armed conflict in the Persian Gulf could raise these economic costs even higher. One hopeful sign is that Admiral Watkins has announced that he will recommend a drawdown of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve if there's war in the Persian Gulf. That is a good sign. It was the view of the chair, and, I'm, and from my discussions with the gentleman from Indiana, it was his view that this should have been used as a device to moderate the panic buying, stockpiling, and other things which, which occurred in August and September. And we are curious uh, about the views of the department now. If we had drawn down the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in August and September, could we have avoided, in the view of that agency, much of the harm caused by the embargo? 
As I've indicated, I think so. I'm not sure the administration feels the same way. The questions do remain. The other question is, will our allies draw down their strategic stocks of oil? Is there a world plan to address the, any economic and supply consequences that will flow from a shutoff or from a war? Is there a United States plan to deal with this question? One of the concerns of the chair is that the department has been discussing a national energy strategy, which is the hope of, I understand, the administration that uh, such strategy will be adopted and will be promulgated. It is, of course, the hope of the chair that such will be done. The question, of course, will be before us today as to where is that plan. Uh, we are, of course, confronted with the problem of if the secretary's recommendations are made, will the president act? On the downside, the chair notes we've used most of the world's surge capacity to produce oil. There is little likelihood that any shortfall will be made up with increased production. While we all hope that an armed conflict, if one occurs, and we hope it will not, will be quick and successful, I am concerned that the administration has not planned for the possibility that it will not be. A prolonged conflict could cause serious energy dis disruptions and significant economic impacts, not only on the economy of the United States, but upon the economy of the world. In addition, there is the question of terrorism, which will have to be addressed. I hope that the hearing today will help us prepare for the decisions that are going to be made in coming days. Because the committee has not yet formally organized and committee rules have not yet been adopted, this briefing, the chair notes, is not a formal hearing. However, customary procedures of the Committee on Energy and Commerce will be followed. The chair will recognize now the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, Chairman of the Subcommittee, Mr. Sharp, for purposes of an opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As you indicated, the most compelling concern of all of us are the lives that are at stake uh, in the Persian Gulf at this point. <laughs> But the immediate responsibilities of our committee is to help make sure that our government is prepared to move uh, efficiently and effectively to protect the economy and uh, people's jobs here at home uh, in the event that uh, there is a military uh, uh, event, a, a war in the Persian Gulf, uh, and or other lesser events that will disrupt the markets and send the prices rising uh, through the roof. And we know that those will have a damaging effect on our economy and the lives of many people here at home and not to mention around the world. The most important thing that we have done is consistently and persistently in the Congress and usually had administrations that were willing to go along, uh, fill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and have this stockpile of oil ready to be utilized to help moderate the price impact on our economy uh, when the market is disrupted. We have that in place, as everyone knows. Many of us believe it ought to be expanded, but it is available for use. And it is imperative that the administration in the United States, in coordination with the Germans and the Japanese, use it immediately upon the outbreak of any uh, military activity there. And they have many of options as to how to make use of it, but it must be very clear to everyone in the world market that it will be used. The Secretary of Energy has indicated that that will be the case, but I think it is critical that the President himself indicate that, given the fact that there has been an internal debate in the administration with opposition from the Treasury Department and elsewhere at every turn of this debate uh, over the last six months. And so uh, a policy that we thought was absolutely agreed upon uh, during the Reagan administration years and agreed upon by the large bulk of energy experts, that is that there would be early use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, either in a small amount or in a large amount, but whatever amount, it would be early use uh, as an effort to quell and calm the marketplace. That policy, frankly, has been in question because of this internal debate uh, in the administration and the reluctance to use it thus far. So it is imperative uh, that the administration follow through on the Secretary of Energy's uh, a commitment to use it, and I think it would be very wise for the President uh, to make that clear. I also think it is imperative that we lead, not seek consensus, but that we lead in the IEA uh, and guarantee to the extent we can, and I think we can have enormous influence on their decisions, that the Japanese and the Germans uh, do likewise. Uh, secondly, Mr. Chairman, uh, we want to make sure, as we have probed the Department in the past, that the legal authorities that are necessary for the uh, Department of Energy and the President to uh, assure 
cooperation uh, from those folks in industry who are subject to contracts and other concerns uh, are able to uh, move shipments of oil uh, or other products, crude oil or other products, uh, if it becomes imperative that this uh, happen. Sometimes the term allocation is used. I think none of us believe that we ought to resort to the 1970s approach of uh, over a full-scale uh, allocation system. But we do know that there can be uh, critical moments at which it is imperative that we get and have what we hope will be voluntary, but oftentimes a company cannot voluntarily comply if it's contractually uh, committed elsewhere uh, to movement of oil or products to critical points of need. Uh, the administration has this authority if IEA is triggered and it is actually sharing oil, but that is a very restricted uh, set of circumstances. It has the capacity under the current law to do this under Strategic Petroleum Reserve oil to uh, allocate that. Um, however, uh, with the veto uh, when uh, Senator McClure and myself and others on the House side, the chairman of this committee uh, and the full Congress sought to give that broader authority to the President back in the early 1980s was vetoed, so it does not exist on a broad basis. And with the expiration, which I think was a terrible mistake last fall, of the Defense Production Act, it passed the House of Representatives, but got bollocked up in the Senate. Uh, the President and the Secretary at this point have less room to move than I think is advisable, and I think many here in the Congress think advisable for the President to have. And I think it's imperative that we uh, move rapidly in the Congress and uh, we discuss with the administration uh, the, the Defense Production Act. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your cooperation and the significance you have over the years given to this issue and look forward to hearing our witnesses. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Cohen. I thank the chairman and for his leadership in bringing this to the forefront at this time. Um, I also appreciate this opportunity to receive um, an update from the Department of Energy on its role in protecting our energy resources during the uh, Persian Gulf crisis particularly, even though energy considerations are just one factor in the Gulf situation, it is important to focus on them since we are uncertain uh, as to the length um, of the outcome of the drain on our resources of this crisis. It's in our own best interest to have a long-range plan for energy resources, something we've needed for a long time, uh, regardless of the current um, international entang entanglements and to monitor consumption patterns, particularly in situations where some of our sources and our allies' uh, sources may be uh, cut off or temporarily disrupted. Our national security is obviously at risk if our energy supply is threatened. Our military and its support systems are a force to be reckoned with only if they are readily mobile and not on a short leash because of energy constraints. This is a particularly critical time in the Gulf crisis, and we must have abundant resources at our disposal to ensure that we are capable of accomplishing what needs to be done uh, in the Gulf and in maintaining uh, stability worldwide. I look forward to the uh, hearing from the gentleman here this morning, and we'll have some questions for them later. Thank you very much, and I yield back the balance. Thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I commend you and our uh, and subcommittee chairman Sharp for organizing this briefing and for your continuing oversight of the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, I can be fairly well certain that uh, our committee is going to be ever more deeply immersed in these uh, issues this year. Mr. Chairman, the Department of Energy is one of the most disappointing agencies in our government. The sweep of its responsibilities is vast, from nuclear weapons production to strategic petroleum reserves to energy efficiency. The power of an energy secretary to move this country forward is at least as great as the power of any other cabinet secretary. Moreover, the potential for the Department of Energy to provide preventative medicine, thereby diminishing the likelihood of war or economic suffering, is nearly unmatched. Yet in the last 10 years of its existence, it has for the most part drifted without a helmsman or a rudder, while the global and domestic energy crisis have grown unabated. 
The fact that we are now more dependent on foreign oil than we were 20 years ago on the eve of the first OPEC embargo is shocking testament to the utter failure of our energy policy makers. The Department of Energy reminds me of a bureaucratic Bart Simpson, an underachiever and proud of it. Unfortunately, the cost of this failure is not falling on those responsible for it. No, the cost of our energy policy failure is falling on the families of kids who are on the verge of a massive ground and air conflict in Kuwait and Iraq. Young men and women have been asked to lay down their lives because a succession of energy policy leaders have been too timid to do their job. From Ronald Reagan to George Bush, we have met, watched as ideologues have honed paradigms and paradigms have honed more ideologues as energy policy has dissolved into a game of rhetorical one-upsmanship. The only thing we have been able to count on is that any good idea will be opposed. Congress had to force the filling of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve over administration objections. Congress had to force the enactment of nationwide appliance efficiency standards that promised savings equivalent to 20 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plants. We had to pass that twice because Ronald Reagan vetoed it the first time after Congress approved this initiative virtually unanimously. Congress had to force the administration to fund the weatherization program for low-income homes. The administration has had its victories, of course. The administration rolled back fuel economy standards for automobiles even after Chrysler had exceeded those standards. The administration has devastated funding for solar and conservation research. The administration has accom accomplished a budget somersault at Department of Energy. Instead of spending two-thirds of Department of Energy's budget on energy and one-third on nuclear weapons, it is now two-thirds on nuclear weapons and only one-third on energy. And the administration has managed to pull, pour most of our scarce research funding back down a black hole called nuclear energy. There has not been a new nuclear power plant ordered in our country in the last 16 years. There is no mystery to finding an energy policy that is cheap, effective, and enjoys a political consensus. DOE officials spent most of the last two years touring the country looking for a national energy policy. We will find one this year. It will be produced out of this committee. My only hope is that finally, this administration will realize how critical it is to the security of our country and the lives of the young men and women who are over in the sands of Saudi Arabia today. I yield back the balance of my time. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have an uh, opening statement prepared, just a, a few brief remarks. I'd first welcome our friends from the Department of Energy and say to my friend from Massachusetts, if he waits for the Department of Energy to produce one ounce of energy, uh, he waits in vain. Uh, never uh, was uh, contemplated the uh, Department of Energy to, in fact, produce uh, energy at all. Uh, that uh, fortunately has still been left to the, uh, what's left of the private sector and the energy producing uh, area in this country. And uh, so I don't think we should start with the premise that uh, somehow the Department of Energy should be producing energy. What our role is, it seems to me, is uh, to learn uh, from these uh, folks and also to learn uh, how we can reverse uh, what I think has been a disturbing trend uh, in this country of um, denying the ability of our energy producing uh, facilities uh, to do exactly that. Uh, my friend from uh, Massachusetts has consistently opposed uh, the efforts of uh, bringing nuclear energy uh, to bear uh, to uh, provide uh, adequate uh, energy uh, in the electric uh, area for this country. Uh, he has uh, fought uh, consistently against uh, any efforts to, uh, to, to look for uh, domestic sources of uh, oil, uh, either in Alaska or offshore. The list uh, is endless. And I would suggest uh, that uh, we best uh, start uh, very quickly uh, looking for uh, those forms of energy uh, or we will be uh, further behind the eight ball than we already are. Uh, I couldn't agree more that we have seen our reliance on uh, energy uh, from, uh, de from foreign sources uh, increase dramatically. I wouldn't expect that that's going to end anytime soon. 
But I would also suggest that uh, we have an opportunity uh, to uh, craft a national energy policy that is not only uh, oriented towards a free market approach, uh, but is oriented towards uh, the, uh, the ultimate consumer uh, determining how he will use that energy uh, in the most efficient manner. If we can do that, and this can be the first step in that uh, very difficult process, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that this hearing will have been uh, worthwhile. And instead of an opportunity to uh, bash uh, the administration or to uh, bash the department uh, or to bash uh, whoever happens to be uh, available, uh, to sit down and uh, really work out a national energy policy where we can draw a consensus uh, from. And if this uh, hearing is the first uh, step in that uh, process, then I'm a willing participant. And I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden. No opening statement, Mr. Chairman. I think it's an important hearing, and I look forward to our witnesses. Chairman, it would be inappropriate, if not irreverent, for the youngest member of the committee to have an opening statement. Let me just... Uh, Newest. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. I've been no. corrected. <laughs> <laughs> gentleman from New Mexico. For the timeliness of this hearing, I'm not going to have an opening statement except to say that the overwhelming message that I receive from my constituents, and I think many of our colleagues have received the same, is that we don't have an energy policy in this country. Uh, we sit here today uh, debating these issues that uh, are going to be the focus of this hearing, and at the same time, uh, from the Department of Energy, uh, from press reports, we see that. Uh, what right now is at the White House is a list of options, uh, not recommendations. Uh, this process is not complete, so I don't think we can pass final judgment on it. But I think, too, in this uh, Congress, Mr. Chairman, uh, despite the strong efforts of this committee, uh, we have not focused on a viable energy policy. I think we started with the Clean Air Act. But now the time has come, I think, to make the major priority of this committee and of this Congress a new energy policy, and we can sit back here and blame each other. But I think very clearly, uh, regardless of what happens this morning in Geneva, uh, a, a policy that makes us less dependent on foreign oil, a policy that gives us incentives for oil and gas drilling in this country, that focuses attention on conservation, on renew renewable sources of energy, on alternative fuels, uh, what do we do about the Defense Production Act? the Strategic Petroleum Reserve are, are questions that should have been settled long ago. Mr. Chairman, uh, you uh, and Mr. Sharp led us in the past on uh, a number of energy initiatives, uh, Clean Air Act of last year, uh, decontrol of natural gas. I think there are many other measures we need to take. I hope that this is a start for the main issue that this Congress should focus on, and that's an energy policy for this country. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. The uh, gentleman from Colorado desire to make an opening statement. Very well. Uh, our first witness is the Honorable John J. Easton, Jr., Assistant Secretary for International Affairs and Energy Emergencies. Mr. Secretary, we are delighted you are with us. We thank you for being here. We recognize you for such opening statements as you choose to give. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think to help the committee understand the emergency pre preparedness preparations of the department, it would be helpful to understand the context in which we are conducting those preparations. Uh, that is, uh, that context, uh, the world oil market, will be covered by the Deputy Administrator of the Energy Information Administration, Larry Pettis, on my left. Mr. Pettis will give you an overview of how the market stands today so that you can see the conditions under which we are formulating our responses, because any response must be formulated in terms of the actual marketplace and the conditions as we see them. And so for the opening of this, uh, Mr. Pettis will cover, and then I'll tell you what we've done so far. Larry? Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm pleased to be here today to provide you a brief overview of the current situation with respect to petroleum supply and prices. Uh, we have provided a handout to each of you, and, a, and you may want to refer to that as I go through my points. I, if you'll turn to the sixth page in that handout, 
which is uh, labeled Exhibit 1, you will see uh, this, this chart presents uh, the effects of the cutoff of supplies <laughs> from Iraq and Iran. And what it shows is, is that by November of this year, the 4.3 million barrel per day loss in crude supplies had been offset by increases in productions from other countries and that we expect that situation to continue throughout the first quarter of this year. More than half of that increase is in Saudi Arabia, but there have been major contributions from other countries such as Iran, the United Arab Emirates, Venezuela, Nigeria, North Sea, and Mexico. If you'll turn to ex Exhibit 2, this provides the current status of crude oil stocks in the United States. I think there's two notable points here. One is that stocks were very high just prior to the invasion but that they have been drawn down over the past four months and are currently in the normal range. If you will turn to Exhibit 3, this provides the current status of distillate fuel oil stocks. Uh, distillate stocks have remained well above the levels of the last two years since the invasion of Kuwait. Stocks are also higher on the East Coast and in the Midwest, the areas that are most dependent upon heating oil uh, in the winter period. Stocks currently appear to be adequate for the, to meet the winter demands this year. If you will turn to Exhibit 4, that provides the current status of motor gasoline stocks. Again, there's two points that are noteworthy here. You will notice that back in the August time frame, gasoline stocks fell very close to the minimum operating inventory as supplies were very tight immediately following the invasion. Uh, U.S. refiners continued to maintain high refinery runs uh, in September and, re and replenished gasoline stocks and they are currently within the normal range. Exhibit 5 is the uh, uh, Carol Jet stock information. Primary level jet fuel stocks remain well above last year despite increases in demand this year. Uh, there are currently no apparent problems, but this is an area which we will continue to monitor very closely. Exhibit 6 is propane stocks. As you are all well aware, we had a problem with propane last winter and there was considerable concern in the late summer, early fall uh, regarding propane stocks when they were 8 to 10 million barrels above, below the level of the last two years. Uh, these, this situation has improved significantly, partially due to the warmer than normal weather that we've had in recent months, and stocks are now well above where they were at the end of last year and only slightly below uh, the levels of 1988. Uh, uh, again, stocks are also high on the East Coast and Midwest areas that are dependent on propane for heating fuels, and we currently believe that the propane stocks are adequate unless there are some very unusually cold weather or refinery problems. Exhibit 7 provides uh, the capacity utilization of refineries. I think there's two important points here. One is that, that refineries continue to operate at a very high utilization rate into September this year to replenish gasoline stocks, which I noted earlier had declined, and also to produce additional jet fuel. Uh, since October, refineries have been operating in a normal level for this time of year, taking into the consideration that we have a reduced demand this year due to the higher prices. Uh, currently, we do not foresee problems in the near term in the c capacity of refineries here in the U.S. or worldwide. Are there United States? These are the United States figures. Between the United States figures and, and the international figures? C certainly in terms of stocks, there, there are. The, I mean, this, our 
the U.S. stocks would make up a portion of the international total stocks. Is there any big aberration between U.S. stocks and, 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 and international stocks? Mm -hmm. For example, you've shown us the levels of international stocks. Could you submit to us the U.S. levels? Could you submit to us the same figures with regard to U.S. levels of supply? The, these are the U.S. figures. We could provide you. These are U.S. as opposed to international? Yes, oh, that's very well. correct. Thank you. Uh, if you could skip through the next three pages, we have provided a brief write-up of how we believe the market has responded both in last winter's heating fuel crisis and in the current events. But if you would skip through those pages and move on to Exhibit 8, you will see the crude oil price movements that have occurred since the uh, invasion of Kuwait. Prices moved up very abruptly in August with the loss of exports from Iraq and Kuwait, uncertainty about whether replacement supplies would be made available by other countries, and also fears that the conflict could spread. From August 1 to October 11th, spot West Texas Intermediate prices rose $19 a barrel to 41.07. Since late October, with the addition of the replacement crude supplies from other countries and optimism that there might be a peaceful solution to the conflict in the Middle East, crude oil prices have declined considerably. In early January, they have been in the 24 to $27 per barrel range, which we would expect is $1 to $4 from the long-term equilibrium price before the invasion. You would turn to Exhibit 9. This chart shows the movement of both crude oil prices, spot or wholesale gasoline prices, and retail prices. If you look at the long-term trend, crude oil prices have traditionally followed gasoline prices, and that is gasoline prices typically increase about two and a half cents per gallon for each dollar per barrel increase in crude oil prices. Shortly after the invasion, because of the tight supplies in gasoline, spot gasoline prices on the New York Harbor peaked at $1.10 in August on August 23 due to these tight supplies. There was considerable restraint at the retail level. Gasoline prices rose only 17 cents a gallon in August and only 27 cents per gallon at their peak in October, less than 60 percent of the increase in the crude oil cost. Since October, spot gasoline prices fell more rapidly than crude oil prices and are now at about 67 cents. And retail prices have also fallen significantly, but not as quickly as crude oil prices, and are now at about $1.25 per gallon. Part of the, the, as you recall, there's also been a $0.05 cent per gallon increase in gasoline tax, so that is a portion of the reason for crude oil, I mean, retail gasoline prices not falling as much as crude oil. Exhibit 10. Uh, provides the same information for number two fuel oil. Uh, I think there's, you can see two events on this sheet. One, last winter's heating oil crisis where you see the sharp spike in wholesale prices and as a, about as abrupt a decline in the wholesale prices as weather warmed and supplies were brought to the market. This year, by mid-October, residential heating oil prices in the Northeast had reached $1.38 per gallon, about 95 percent of the increase in crude cost, and residential prices have declined since that time, reaching about $1.21 this last week. Exhibit 11 has similar information for pro Propane by mid-October, residential propane prices were about $1.30 per gallon on the East Coast and $0.98 cents per gallon in the Midwest. By, by mid-December, these prices had declined to $1.26 and $0.86 cents respectively, and the U.S. average was $0.98 cents per gallon. <coughs> Exhibit 11 is the uh, 
spot price information for Carojet. Uh, the New York Harbor spot price for Carajet fuel soared in October as a result of a number of factors. One was increased military demand for jet fuel and the loss of the Kuwait refinery, which was a major supplier of jet fuel to the military in the Far East markets. Spot prices declined uh, rather sharply and have fallen almost 50 percent since mid-October and are now within three cents of heating oil, which is the normal spread between those two products. <clears throat> Just in, in conclusion, to summarize the points that we made here, the loss of uh, crude supplies from Iraq and Kuwait have now in, been offset by increases from other countries. The increased price of oil and petroleum products has and should continue to induce conservation and fuel switching and dampen petroleum demand. Overall, U.S. petroleum demand has been down about 4 percent over the last four months relative to the same time last year. U.S. petroleum stocks are all in the normal range and appear to be adequate to meet winter demand. We will continue to monitor very closely. Uh, the Carajet stocks and propane stocks and refinery capacity utilization in the U.S. and worldwide markets currently appears to be adequate. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Pettis's testimony makes it clear that the world crude production has increased to replace the lost oil from Kuwait and Iraq and that there is no oil shortage. That's one fundamental fact we must take into consideration. And I think the second point to be made, which has been critical to our preparedness, is that the U.S. and the Allies do have the capability to respond to any further interruptions in supply that might occur. Uh, very simply stated, the operation of the free market has restored and stabilized world oil production to levels that prevailed before the rise in prices and that served the function of both enhancing oil supplies and reducing demand. Should hostilities occur, however, uh, DOE believes that the currently available strategic and commercial stocks, as well as the oil and floating storage, would be sufficient to offset any plausible further disruption in supplies. In addition, uh, product stocks are at comfortable levels, as you heard from Mr. Pettis, including stocks of propane, which were low at the beginning of the season, but now are deemed sufficient to meet uh, the demand which is expected. Following the invasion, Admiral Watkins ordered an immediate focus by the Department on the Persian Gulf issues. And since that time, we have done the following. We've conducted five high-level exercises uh, involving a number of government agencies and uh, members from the uh, congressional branch and the uh, private sector to test our energy emergency plans and to implement any improvements that were identified in the process of these exercises. Secondly, we've run a successful test of uh, selling oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Third, we've been coordinating any required responses with the International Energy Agency uh, at special meetings of the Governing Board. And finally, we've increased our critical data collection uh, for activities in the Middle East. Let me elaborate very briefly on each of these four activities. First, the emergency exercises we've conducted. Since August 2nd, my Office of Energy Emergencies has conducted five major exercises at the interagency level to test our existing response plans. In September, we conducted uh, exercises in which we ran a range of possible disruption scenarios, planning for additional losses of regional oil uh, in two of the exercises. In November, we ran a test uh, scenario of the current case, and uh, we looked at some of the economic and environmental risk assessment and the impact of military fuel requirements. Also in November, my office simulated the impact of severe winter weather, such as we had about a year ago in December. Finally, on December 20th, we ran our fifth exercise in which we conducted a high-level public affairs and interagency coordination exercise to examine the government's ability to get vital information on energy supplies to the Congress, to the energy markets, and to the American public in the first critical days 
of any potential conflict. Uh, the Sec Secretary of Energy, the Defense, Civilian and Intelligence Agencies, the National Security Council, uh, other executive offices, industry executives, uh, public policy analysts, and senior staff from both House and Senate committees have participated in these five exercises. I think the result of these is we are prepared to implement an immediate response to a wide range of possible emergencies which could occur. Uh, second is the conflict-related data monitoring and analysis. Uh, since August, uh, both the Energy Information Administration and the Department of Energy's Office of Intelligence have been working continuously to improve the uh, monitoring uh, capability and to direct the flow of very time-sensitive uh, information to the key decision makers and analysts who must react to this. Some of the reports, for example, that the EIA is putting out, I think, are a result of this. Third is the test sale of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which was uh, ordered in September. As part of the EPCA extension, uh, you gave us, the Congress gave the President the authority to conduct test sales. On September 28th, we issued a notice of sale for 5 million barrels. Offers were opened on October 5th, and contracts were awarded by the 18th of October. Deliveries began the very next day on October 19th. I think the result of this test sale is that it accomplished all of its objectives. The physical ability of the system to draw down and deliver oil was proven as were the equally important bidding, contracting, and scheduling processes. However, during the test, we were confronted with substantial evidence that there may not be enough U.S. flag tankers to support a large SPR drawdown. Uh, the SPR contains 586 million barrels of crude oil, which are stored in salt caverns, as you know, in Louisiana and Texas. And we've applied the lessons learned from that test sale, and today, uh, the SPR remains at alert, ready to implement a full-scale drawdown. Uh, next, I IEA preparations. Since August 2nd, the International Energy Agency Governing Board has met five times to assess the impact of the crisis on world oil markets and also to evaluate the IEA member countries' response capabilities. Currently, the Governing Board does not believe the situation warrants a formal emergency response at this time, However, in the event of any possible hostilities, the Board is prepared to implement response actions already developed for use and if needed. I might add that uh, this Friday is uh, a sixth meeting of the Governing Board to continue to refine the uh, response mechanisms of the IEA, and I will be leaving this evening to attend that. Let me briefly discuss the emergency legal authorities. Uh, as you know, the Department has a number of uh, emergency authorities uh, other than those that were available under the now expired Defense Production Act. For example, the Energy Policy and Conservation Act, EPCA, empowers the Secretary of Energy to use the SPR and also contains provisions to facilitate U.S. involvement in the activities of the IEA. Uh, as this committee is aware, the non-permanent provisions of the Defense Production Act, the DPA, expired last October 20th. Uh, this authority would have allowed priority access to materials, such as petroleum products, needed to support Operation Desert Shield. The Department of Energy strongly recommends an extension of the DPA to include Sections 135 and 141 of last year's conference report to H.R. 486. We believe that these two energy-related provisions are not controversial and should not cause the Congress to delay action on a short-term extension of the DPA. I should say we do not believe that there are any additional emergency authorities uh, cited in your invitational letter which are needed to ensure an effective response to a severe oil emergency. The administration would strongly oppose any new price control or allocation authority. As we've testified many times, there's ample evidence that the complex system of price and allocation controls only serve to exacerbate petroleum supply disruptions and should play no role in the federal government's response to any energy emergency. Let me finally uh, conclude with an assessment of our preparedness activities uh, by asking the question, how has this exercising and testing contributed to supporting the President and protecting the American people? 
Our data collection and analysis programs have confirmed that the surge production worldwide since November has completely offset the 4.3 million barrels of lost oil. As Mr. Pettis said, worldwide commercial stocks are the highest in four years by about 150 million barrels. Here at home, demand has dropped uh, 4 percent, as Mr. Pettis indicated, since August. In our short-term response measures and uh, higher prices, those two combined have pushed U.S. crude production up by 200,000 barrels daily. So there is no oil shortage at this time. We believe that most of the major players in the energy markets understand that supply fundamentals will remain positive even in the event that hostility should erupt. Our, an our analysts have been available and are available to brief both you and your staff so that this important information can be shared with your constituents as soon as possible. And I hope the Congress will join with the administration so that we can get the facts about our petroleum supply out to the American public within the next few weeks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm prepared to take your questions. The Secretary, the committee thanks you. The Chair is going to recognize members uh, in order of their appearance in accordance with the rules of the committee uh, for five minutes each. The Chair will begin with the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Char Sharp, Chairman of the Energy and Power Subcommittee. Mr. Sharp. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Easton, uh, does the United States government now have commitments from Germany and Japan uh, to cooperate in a drawdown should hostilities break out uh, in the Persian Gulf? We have not yet reached that stage, uh, Mr. Sharp. We do have, as part of uh, the IEA emergency uh, planning, we have what those countries have indicated as their response <coughs> capabilities to a range of possible uh, disruption scenarios. The IEA has a standing group on emergency questions, which has met about as many times as the governing board to prepare the countries and determine what the countries will do in various scenarios. And so we do have commitments from those two countries as to what they would do in a range of disruptions. How fast, if the President of the United States or Mr. Hussein or someone else triggers a significant military action which is apparent to everyone uh, at noon today, how fast can the uh, coordination of the IEA take place to decide to draw down, to announce a drawdown? Mm -hmm. Current plans, uh, Mr. Sharp, are that that would be done within 48 hours. Um, we are meeting again this Friday to uh, refine that uh, process. It, it just strikes me that it ought to be so clear in the minds of the President of the United States and the German government and the Japanese government of at least under what two or three scenarios they would do that it wouldn't take more than a half an hour to, through telephone calls to make an assessment as to whether they're ready to go or not. What that requires and is an advance commitment. And I keep getting the sense that the discussion before this committee previously on this question has always been we're all cocked and primed to talk about it when we get together at these collective meetings. And uh, I hope uh, that I'm an heir in my view that that's what it takes. Uh, 48 hours is a long time to respond in this kind of a, a situation with something that ought to be so clear. In fact, it's in my judgment is a quiver in the president's, uh, uh, an arrow in his quiver now uh, that uh, to one more indication to uh, Mr. Uh, Saddam Hussein that we're, we're prepared to move decisively. Uh, and I hope that there's no want of, uh, of decisiveness on that. Let me uh, ask you a second thing. Um, on the uh, Jones Act waivers, am I correct that you folks now within the administration feel that you have the ability to grant the waivers with sufficient speed if American tankers are not available that foreign tankers can be used and not disrupt a, a major drawdown of SPRO? I do believe that is the case, uh, Mr. Sharp. We have two current uh, memorandums of understanding among the three primary agencies, uh, the uh, Department of Energy, the Customs Service of Treasury, and the Maritime Administration of DOT. One uh, arose out of last winter's uh, uh, problem with transporting uh, products. The other has been in place for several years now dealing with the SPR. And uh, we, have, uh, we believe that those memoranda do provide for a mechanism so that 
Jones Act waivers can be ex expeditiously processed. But that, I appreciate that, and that's extremely important, obviously. Third question I have uh, relates to your indication there is no physical shortage, which uh, certainly uh, uh, is the evidence at this point. My concern is that the language of some administration officials and the legal language uh, that is in EPCA suggest that there will never be a use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve until there is something called a physical shortage. But in the reality, in a deregulated market, what happens is the price always goes up to help alleviate the shortage, that is, to drive somebody out of buying from the marketplace. That is what the market is all about. That's what the pricing mechanism uh, is all about. So that you will theoretically never reach a point where there is a physical shortage. The price will be first $35, and $45, then $55, then $100 a barrel, and somebody will quit buying. They can't afford it. They don't want to buy. And uh, so we, I, I'm trying to drive out of the thinking <laughs> of uh, some of the ideologues that I sense at the department that every time they hear the word, if they don't get somebody chiming in and saying there's a physical shortage identified, then uh, we don't respond. The, the purpose of this thing is to protect the economy from a major disruption of the marketplace. And we can argue about whether that's a $10 a barrel increase or $15 or $25 a barrel increase that is the major disruption. But I hope that we're out of this simplistic notion, which is in everybody's speeches, that it's a physical shortage that is apparent. My concern about the current situation is we have, through great surge capacity in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Venezuela, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the Alaskan fields, the Texans fields, uh, all are up uh, in production. And that has helped uh, unquestionably in this current situation as well as decline in demand. How much more surge capacity is there is the real question. And uh, uh, I, I, if I, my time is going to run out here, but I really um, uh, am a little concerned about the sanguine view of the department uh, about a replacement of facilities in the Middle East during military actions there. Uh, and maybe I should get to that quickly and just ask you the question. If Raz Tanura, uh, I don't know to what degree uh, militarily people think they can defend that massive complex there uh, off the coast of Saudi Arabia, or on Saudi, uh, there at Saudi Arabia in the Gulf, but uh, obviously an enormous quantity of oil uh, flows through that. And uh, it has uh, survived some fires there, so it's uh, there's, there's obviously pre preparation. What preparation? I mean, how vulnerable is that? And wouldn't there be then some major gyrations in the market if if that kind of a place is struck? Admiral Watkins and I uh, visited that part of Saudi Arabia a little over a month ago, and in our discussions, both with the, the ministry, with Saudi Aramco officials, uh, with General Schwarzkopf. Uh, we believe that that is uh, quite well uh, protected, quite well defended. It certainly has, uh, uh, as most of the Saudi complexes do, has a great deal of redundancy. We, as you notice, there was a fire that, uh, uh, but yet the uh, the refinery at Rastanur is still uh, is still operational. It's still producing, and uh, and so the. We have not uh, significantly hampered our capability uh, to receive uh, products from that refinery. It is producing right now at about 50 percent. So we feel that the security uh, plans, as we were briefed, uh, do appear quite adequate, and we have a very large number of troops there. I, I just <clears throat> always am hoping that I think it's very important the planning processes you folks have been going through, and, and it certainly departments to be commended for that. Um, I, I just hope that in the thinking you don't keep ruling out the worst kind of events because sometimes they happen. They, of course, are those people who always focus on the worst events and they never happen, but there are those who always like to ignore uh, these possibilities. And I'm, I'm uh, hoping that you, uh, uh, in, in war, uh, if there's anything we know about it, and some of us are not as uh, experienced in that as Admiral Watkins, but. Um, uh, we know that the unexpected is the rule, and uh, and all planners, all predictors uh, have always, almost always been wrong uh, in warfare about what will occur and what won't occur. And uh, so well, I it, hope that we're, we're also doing some programming for large bad events. Well, it was for that reason that the very first exercise we conducted in early September simulated 
an additional 2.5 million barrel loss on top of the 4.3 we lost from Kuwait and Iraq. And then since then, we've simulated even greater losses. Uh, obviously, the responses to these levels of loss uh, would involve a very heavy reliance on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and the use of stocks uh, by our allies. But we have in our exercises, and as I say, the very first exercise, considered right off the bat what happens if we lose another two and a half on top of the 4.3. The uh, time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Mullen. <coughs> oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is, um, are we saying that a worst case scenario is, I suppose you could expand on this with your imagination, but the likely loss of daily production in the event of, uh, of a conflict in the Middle East would be in the range of 2.3 million barrels a day? Congressman, I would uh, not like to use worst case scenarios because worst case could vary in the minds of different people. We have used what we consider a range of plausible disruption scenarios. Uh, we used one of two and a half and we used a, a larger scenario um, just to look at different ramifications and different responses uh, so that we simply weren't looking at, at uh, at optimistic viewpoints, but some pessimistic viewpoints as well. But could you define what, what that 2.3 million would be? The 2.5 that we Five. simulated in early September is uh, roughly the amount of uh, production uh, coming out of uh, the large field in uh, northern uh, Saudi Arabia, Asafaniya, uh, that, that complex. Uh, so that was the, the connection, if you will, to what, uh, to what to determine that first scenario of a loss of two and a half. Well, well given that as a benchmark, uh, what then would be the policy with respect to the Department and the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in offsetting that, um, that disruption, hopefully a short-term and temporary disruption? As Edmund Watkins has stated to Chairman Dingle and to Mr. Sharp and to others, uh, it would be his recommendation to immediately use the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve. So that uh, one might conclude there then should be no effective shortage, at least in uh, aggregate supply. That is correct. Getting back to the test then that uh, was deemed successful, when was that run? Was it August? It was run in September just after the EPCO was uh, approved. I think the EPCO was approved in uh, mid-September and about uh, a week later, the President uh, ordered the use of that new authority to test the SPR. So at the end of September, we put out the notices of sale, received bids back in early October, awarded the contracts, and started pumping oil in mid-October. Did that sale occur within what time frame? Was it a one-day sale? No, was it was it a sale of five million barrels uh, that started about the 8th, 19th of October and concluded on the 2nd of December. So the end of October and all of November, the oil was delivered to the market. In terms then of constraints, you mentioned um, a lack of barge capacity, is, and, and uh, I didn't quite get clear whether um, that has been resolved? Would that be an impediment, or is it uh, something that's been worked out? The, the, one of the uh, issues that the industry that uh, responded, after we ran the test sale, we uh, gave a questionnaire to industry, and a number of uh, those that both bid on the oil and those who did not indicated they felt that uh, that uh, waivers of the Jones Act to allow for non-U.S. vessels would be necessary in a large draw of, of the SPR. And so that's, uh, and Congressman Sharp wanted to know about do we have the mechanism in place to grant waivers, and we do have two memorandum of understanding that govern the process by which these waivers will be granted. One other factor, uh, one other question uh, that's been we haven't discussed here today, I don't believe, and that is uh, an indicated um, constraints on refining capacity in the United States as being more of a constraint than the supply of, uh, of crude. Would you care to comment on that? There was some uh, 
some concern after the invasion first took place in August that we were going to have the wrong type of crude coming to the market and the inability of the world's refineries to deal with that. I think the, uh, the outcome has been uh, that that pessimistic uh, worry was, was not realized, that we were able to uh, refine the replacement oil. The replacement oil was not that different, uh, greatly different in terms of either the specific gravity uh, or the sweet, uh, sour aspects of it. And uh, right now, our refining, refining uh, capacity is uh, in the mid-80s, about 84 or 85 percent of utilization. So I think that we are uh, capable of handling all the oil that, uh, all the crude oil that's coming into the country and that we're producing ourselves. I realize that there are some um, different opinions with respect to the degree to which the reserve should be used to try to influence price. And we're sitting here in a situation in which you've testified that essentially the world's supply today is, uh, is uh, back to normal despite the uh, lack of flow from Iraq and Kuwait, and yet the price is uh, elevated above uh, pre-crisis levels, indicating that it's based on something other than, than supply and demand. Did the release of, uh, of the five, th uh, five million barrels have any uh, impact on price at that time, in your judgment? It really uh, didn't, uh, Congressman, and it wasn't intended to. It was certainly not a sufficiently large amount that it would have uh, been intended to impact price in any way. Um, and, that, and our purpose was really not to impact price, but simply to test whether the system worked, both uh, physically and procedurally. Um, one final question. Has the White House indicated that uh, Secretary Watkins' recommendation for, to the use of the SPR will be followed? Or I don't think a formal decision has been made yet, sir. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. The gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, in your worst case scenario planning, Mr. Easton, where does the price of oil go? What did you plan for? I don't know. Larry, was that in our models? And is that a classified model or not? In other words, we, have, we have a number of uh, models, Mr. Markey, that the EIA has run uh, under different uh, s scenarios that may be classified information. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't recall. Is that? The specifics were. We could, we could uh, brief you in a private session. Uh, the Why is that classified? I think because of the... Uh, the impact on uh, the national economy and security as to what might, uh, what might occur. But don't you think that's a factor in terms of all of the um, uh, it, surrounding circumstances uh, that we certainly, have certainly in our a, minds as members of Congress are about to vote oh, on a declaration of war in the next 48 hours? Mr. Markey, we'll be happy to provide that to you under the appropriate circumstances. Well, I, I guess from my perspective, if you're telling us that you can't give us a number that says that the price of oil will go up to 50 or $60 a barrel and that we could be over $2 a gallon for gasoline and, and, uh, and a similar number on home heating oil, uh, then uh, we'd, we appreciate the, the delicacy with which you want to treat us. But uh, I can assure you that not only um, this body, but American families, there's at least 400,000 American families whose sons and daughters are on the line, their lives are on the line, and I think that they have a right to have all the information put out on the table um, at this particular time as the Congress, in consultation with their constituents, are trying to decide this most momentous of decisions, at least most momentous of decisions of my 15 years in Congress, whether we're going to put... Uh, uh, America's young people on the line for the oil fields of uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and Kuwait. Um, my, uh, my question to you is, have you determined then, uh, without getting into the specifics, uh, whether or not action by you will have a significant uh, d um, dampening effect upon uh, its impact upon the American economy? We believe that uh, our responses that we will take in the event of any possible uh, further loss of oil from the market uh, will have an ameliorating effect on, 
on, uh, on economic indicators. Yes, sir. So does that mean that you can bring, you can keep uh, the uh, price of oil in the $25 to $30 range with, um, um, with the deployment of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the worst case scenario? I certainly can't uh, guarantee that. We've seen prices, uh, even the absence of a loss of, uh, of production uh, or the making up of that loss of production run outside that range. So uh, what we can do is show the uh, industry and the consuming public who needs that oil that it will be made available and that there is uh, plenty of oil available at the moment. I understand plenty of oil is available, but for a, a woman with uh, two kids and a three-family home in Boston right now. She's paying 20 to 30 percent higher for her gasoline and home heating oil than she should be, even as its department, even as her Department of Energy is telling her that there's no oil shortage. So you're talking about shortage, and we're talking about prices to uh, consumers in America. And uh, we right now understand that there's a, a large disparity that exists between what you're testifying with regard to the actual supply of energy and what the prices are being charged for it by oil companies and what the price is very likely to become uh, even if you tell us that you have put in place strategies which will ensure that uh, there will be adequate oil supplies. And you say that it's so sensitive that you can't even give it to us because it is classified. And the question I'm asking you, as we're already deep in a recession across this country, the Northeast affected perhaps right now more seriously than other parts of the country, is what you're doing to ensure that uh, the oil companies and others uh, understand fully the responsibilities which they have at this momentous time. And moreover, Mr. Lent and I last year worked, as you know, to include a regional product reserve in the um, in legislation that passed out of this committee and was signed uh, by the uh, president to ensure rapid distribution where oil is needed most, uh, that is in the Northeast, where we're most uh, dependent upon imported oils. What are you doing right now to implement that regional uh, reserve uh, mandate that passed out of this uh, committee Mr. Lent and I sponsored? That mandate required two things, Congressman. One is that we uh, conduct a study to determine how to appropriately uh, exercise that authority and then secondly be in a position to uh, implement the legislation during fiscal year 92. Uh, we have started the process uh, uh, of the study and then that will guide us as to what needs to be done to, confer, to uh, comply with the terms of the statute. So are you committed to its implementation? We're obligated to by the uh, statute, yes sir. Um, let me ask you this then. Um, the uh, extra 30 percent right now, which is uh, being charged to uh, consumers for gasoline and home heating oil, uh, do you think that's unfair? Do you think that's a windfall? Uh, I would not characterize it as a, as a windfall, no, sir. How would you characterize it? I'd characterize it as a result of the economic conditions prevailing in the marketplace. Which says that although there is adequate supply, that prices are going to be 20 to 30 percent higher than they should be? Well, there are other factors than supply. Congressman Sharp mentioned one of them, and that is the, uh, the concern by some that there's limited further surge capability, uh, concern by others that hostilities could erupt, uh, there are a variety of concerns that impact on the marketplace. Okay. So do you think that it might have made some sense then thus far to have already deployed the Strategic Petroleum Reserve if, in fact, the marketplace does not work given those conditions to ensure that there is adequate and proper pricing out in the marketplace. I think the, what our uh, experience has shown is the market price has worked. Uh, prices have brought more oil to the market. Uh, one of the consequences of prices is it affects uh, demand. We've had lower demand. We've had uh, uh, more supply come to the marketplace. We, it's helped make up that uh, part of that lost uh, 4.3 million barrels. So there have, been, uh, there have been some positive effects of the way prices have moved. Uh, that has to obviously be uh, countered by, the, by offsetting the uh, impact on those who can least afford it. And there are programs federally and state uh, uh, available to do that. I guess my problem is that you have invoked the law of unintended consequences, however, Mr. Eason, although I don't know if it's unintended from the perspective of the I think Saddam Hussein invoked it. 
Well, I'm talking about the, in the failure to deploy the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, you've also induced a recession and uh, deepened it to the point where uh, across the Northeast we're talking about it in much more uh, desperate terms than even recession. We're talk using other words. And, uh, and I'm afraid that uh, as you allow oil companies to price um, uh, energy at uh, whatever they might uh, choose to, for the rest of the country, it's an economic uh, disaster. And that extra 20 to 30 percent, which could easily turn into 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 to 100 percent profits in, in the course of a war, uh, in the absence of a strategy, what you're talking about is an economic disaster for our country. And it seems to me that instead of sacrificing American lives in the sands of uh, Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, we should have been using oil and the strategic petroleum reserves to protect those lives. Uh, the failure to use the reserve has led to a premature abandonment of the economic sanctions uh, approach in favor of an imminent war, and that is my fear. It has also led to a deepening recession as totally unjustified gasoline and home heating oil prices uh, stayed high with no oil shortage whatsoever. Oil companies called their new windfalls anomalies. Well, one man's anomaly, Mr. Chairman, is another man's catastrophe. Be he a soldier in the Gulf or a poor mother trying to maintain a family, uh, the result has been that the price is going to be paid by the poorest in our society, whether they be those soldiers or those poor mothers in the inner cities of our country. The time of the gentleman has expired. The uh, gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Easton, you'll be glad to know I do not blame you for the uh, recession. Thank you, sir. Uh, nor the uh, situation in the Gulf. Thank you. Um, Mr. Easton, you had commented in your uh, statement that and you say, however, during the t this is uh, uh, regarding the uh, test sale in September. <laughs> during the uh, test, we were confronted with substantial evidence that there will not be enough U.S. flagged tankers to support a large SPR oil drawdown. Now, I understand that the waiver system works for <clears throat> uh, SPRO oil, and it also works for heating oil, but it does not apply to non-SPRO petroleum products. Is that a correct assessment? No, it's um, the requirements of the Jones Act are that U.S. flagged vessels uh, transport from port to port, from U.S. Uh, to U.S. ports. So if we had any domestic product being moved between U.S. ports, uh, it would uh, require uh, either a U.S. flagged vessel or a waiver of the Jones Act. And uh, it applies to anything, whatever is being transported. It could be energy products, any type of petroleum product, or it could be any other commodity. Okay. I, I guess perhaps you mis misunderstood the question. I was talking about the ability to speed up the waiver process uh, in a memo of understanding uh, and how that would apply to non-SPRO uh, product. We, in uh, in the uh, Memorandum of Understanding, we have defined uh, energy supplies as fuel oils, number two, four, five, and six, kerosene, uh, liquefied natural gas, and liquefied petroleum gases. So it would cover, I think, the range of petroleum products that might, uh, that might have to be transported. And that, uh, so that's not only SPR oil, but it could be any of these energy <coughs> supplies that I just mentioned. Okay. I think that, um Mr. DeBona may have something to say about that at a later panel. I was just trying to, to set the stage for that. It's, mm -hmm. it's my impression that the, the list might be a, a bit uh, short in terms of some products. My, my impression was that it essentially dealt with the home heating oil and, uh, and products from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, the list you gave me seemed to be a bit longer. I'm, I'm just trying to flesh this out. Um, we, we think we've been... Uh, comprehensive, but if there is uh, some type of uh, petroleum product that the industry feels is not covered, we would take a fresh look at this and see what it might be. What about non-SPR crude? Is that covered, is that covered under the uh, extensive waiver process? I'm, I'm trying to think where we might be transporting non-SPR crude. Um, uh, we, we, would ob we obviously import a great deal of crude oil, and uh, uh, that can come in. If it, but if it's being transported between American ports, well, for example, so would, would Alaska Valdez, oil, would, would, would Valdez that has to be, come in on Jones Act uh, That is vessels. under the Jones Act. Anything transporting between, so the, the big oil that we move is the Alaska oil, and that has to be on Jones Act vessels. 
Well, one of the, the concerns that I had, and, and if you recall, I think you were here, as a matter of fact, in uh, 89, in the winter of 89, uh, uh, that uh, there was a great deal of concern at that time that there were allegedly vessels outside the ports of the East Coast uh, that were uh, filled with uh, home heating oil uh, and that uh, they were uh, sit allegedly sitting there waiting for the price to go uh, even further. As a matter of fact, there were some comments from this committee exactly to that. When we looked into it, it appeared that uh, there were some uh, problems with the Jones Act. And uh, at that point, we determined that we would try to facilitate a, a situation where waivers could be available um, under those circumstances so you didn't have this anomaly of, of ships uh, literally sitting off port, not for the reason of that was prescri uh, prescribed, uh, but in fact uh, because of the Jones Act uh, prohibiting them from uh, delivering their, uh, their product. Well, and that's what led to this uh, most recent memorandum of understanding between uh, the three agencies that deal with these Jones Act waivers. Let me ask you this. Uh, do you have any doubts uh, whatsoever that Germany and uh, Japan um, and uh, the United States will draw down our strategic, uh, all of our strategic petroleum reserves um, if the situation is such that it's required? I'm confident based on the IEA meetings that we uh, that I've attended the last five sessions since August 2nd that uh, if the IEA uh, elects to use its uh, coordinated emergency response measures which includes stock draw that those two countries uh, will participate withdrawing their stocks and um is there a, a particular trigger mechanism? Uh, if you could just explain to the committee a bit how that uh, works, uh, it would there, be uh, most There important. are two response systems that the IEA has. One is the emergency sharing system, which has a 7 percent trigger. If uh, there's a loss of 7 percent of the, the oil, that system can be triggered. The second is a more flexible system called the Coordinated Emergency Response Measures, the CIRM, and that involves a variety of both uh, drawing down stocks, using demand restraint, and fuel switching. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Chair recognizes now the gentleman from Oregon. Mr. Wyden, wait, wait. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity for, uh, for these questions. Uh, let me say, Mr., uh, Mr. Easton, my constituents simply don't believe now that the Allies are doing their fair share in Operation uh, Desert Shield. And I must tell you that uh, both in answers to uh, Chairman Sharp and to my colleague from Ohio, Mr., uh, Mr. Oxley, I have not heard you describe what hard commitments we now have from the Allies for dealing with an energy uh, disruption. For example, in response to uh, Congressman Oxley's uh, a question about Germany, Japan. What you said is uh, you're confident that if they agree to uh, a drawdown, then in fact they will have uh, a drawdown. And uh, also, uh, Chairman Sharp asked uh, a question about this. And again, uh, I didn't hear what a, uh, precise commitments the administration has from the Allies in the face of a drawdown. And I want to ask you what you think of the idea of this Friday, when there is another meeting of uh, the IEA, of our country trying to get an advance commitment uh, at that time, that on one hour's notice, that if there is a disruption due to hostilities, that the Germans and the Japanese and, and the others will agree to a drawdown. Wouldn't that be in our national interest to try to get that hard commitment on Friday rather than what we have now is the situation where you're confident and somebody else is confident and maybe it'll happen and maybe it won't. Wouldn't that be in the national interest? One of the reasons for the meeting this Friday, uh, Congressman Wyden, is because the last meeting, the UN, the final UN resolution setting January 15th uh, for a withdrawal, that resolution had not been enacted at the time we had the the previous meeting that called for a 48-hour uh, governing board meeting. So it's 
partly in response to that, that we now have a new factor, a new UN resolution uh, that we are meeting again to, to see whether it makes sense to uh, change the previous, uh, uh, the previous position that we've taken and, uh, and uh, alter it in some way. Well, I, I just think that there's a real good chance that uh, prices are going to go up something like $20 a barrel before uh, anybody even starts to talk about getting a meeting together. And I want to ask it again. Wouldn't it make sense this Friday when there is uh, an opportunity right uh, before the 15th to get an advance commitment then to be able to move on an hour's notice? Wouldn't that be a sensible policy uh, in your opinion, to get that advance commitment on Friday? I think it uh, obviously uh, makes sense to uh, the United States to do all we can to prepare in advance and get everything uh, out of the way that we can, all the decisions that uh, need to be made uh, so that uh, if, we, uh, if hostilities erupt, if, this, uh, uh, if the crisis is not resolved peacefully, that uh, the IEA has uh, done all it can to be ready to move. And so we would agree that the more that we can do to uh, reach an advanced state of preparedness would be uh, useful and would be worthwhile. I, I know you have problems within the administration uh, on this, but I want, want you to know this member and I think others feel that that's the kind of commitment we ought to get, a hard one. We ought to get it this Friday, because just to let this go off into Never Never Land, the way we always seem to do uh, with the Germans uh, and the Japanese, is I, I think uh, uh, not in the national interest. One last question, if I might. Um, the first point that you make with respect to the administration's uh, 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 approach for dealing with a disruption is you say that administration measures to reduce demand and increase uh, production have already uh, made a difference. Could you tell me what measures uh, you're talking about? Because at least with respect, into re it res with respect to reducing uh, demand, as far as I can tell, the only thing that's happened is Secretary Watkins had some good ideas and he went to a cabinet meeting and got clobbered for uh, his ideas on conservation. So if you could uh, tell us um, exactly what measures you're talking about, partic particularly in terms of demand reduction and what difference they've made up to this point, that would be helpful. There were a number of uh, recommendations that were made by the department uh, both in August and September as soon as the uh, 4.3 million barrels were lost. We had what we called short-term measures announced in August, medium-term measures announced in September. These were outside of the whatever we're doing as part of the national energy strategy. The August measures were designed to do whatever we could in a very quick time to either increase production or decrease consumption of oil. Uh, much of the August uh, recommendations in the decreased consumption area had to do with motor vehicle transportation, a public information and awareness campaign to, uh, help uh, motorists uh, determine what they might do to reduce consumption, uh, pointing out the advantages of driving the speed limit, uh, reduce, uh, uh, increasing carpooling, van pooling, and the like. We what, stepped that your, up in September my, by adding additional medium-term measures, which would do, have a longer impact, and some of those measures were... My, my chairman's got the gavel up. Do you have any figures on what uh, 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 the amount of reduced consumption was due to your transportation measures? Uh, I think that, uh, and I'll have Larry correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that we, we can measure the reduced demand, but part of that reduction is due to, to the price consequences. Uh, and so I'm not sure if we can distinguish how much of the reduced demand in this country has been due to price and how much has been due to our measures, but Larry may want to add on that. There were estimates of how much demand could be reduced by these measures, but as John points out, it is very difficult to separate out a number of factors that are going on to reduce demand. My, my, my time is up, but I, I think that uh, demand's down because of recession and weather, and I'd like to see any data you have uh, as to the effect of your measures, because I think it's an illusion to say that your measures have really uh, reduced demand, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, time the gentleman has expired, the chair recognizes now the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Studs.
Mr. Beeson, this is my first session as a member of this committee. I, hence my modest declining to make an opening statement. But I do come here from 15 years of service on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And this morning's session is a good example of why I chose to make that change. I note that your formal title is Assistant Secretary for International Affairs and Energy Emergencies. I don't know if that strikes you as redundant or not. But it seems to me that uh, having sat through that time on the Foreign Affairs Committee, I finally reached the conclusion that if, especially with respect to the turmoil in the Middle East, if one wants to have an impact on the most important decisions of all to be made in foreign affairs, namely whether this country goes to war, that one had better be sitting on this committee rather than on that. And it does seem to me that had we in the past decade had some semblance of a national energy policy, we probably would not be on the verge of a major war at the moment. And therefore, it seems to me that, I don't, this is not to you personally, but that your department, your agency, probably bears as much or more responsibility for the situation in which the United States now finds itself uh, than the Department of State or the Department of Defense or any other agency of this government. And while I might phrase it somewhat more mildly occasionally than my colleague from Massachusetts, I think that is an awesome responsibility to bear as we contemplate uh, what we must contemplate in the next few days. Here, I remember very clearly the recent appearance for the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Secretary of State attempted yet again to explain to the American people why we are where we are in the Persian Gulf. And he, I think correctly, uh, suggested that there was an enormous, there was a considerable diversity of reasons, that there was a complex region, to put it mildly, and there were enormous complexities behind our presence. And he went down some of them. And he talked about the need to deter Iraqi aggression further into Saudi Arabia. He talked about the need to free the hostages. He talked about the need, which some of us feel less compelling than others, to restore the Emir of Kuwait to his throne. He talked, as we increasingly hear talk of these days, about a new world order, which is, sounds very nice. And he talked about the evil man, Saddam Hussein. And he uh, listed a set of, of characteristics of Mr. Hussein that are pretty awesome, and so far as I know, pretty accurate. Uh, he neglected to note that the same description could probably have applied to uh, Mr. Assad of Syria, and that at the moment we are not arrayed against the Syrians. As a matter of fact, we appeared temporarily to be allied with them. And he summed up the situation by saying, well, what it comes down to, simply put, is right versus wrong. I think simply is the correct word there. And I think it is really frightening to suggest to the American people that our troops at the moment are poised on the brink of a some kind of a crusade for right versus wrong. I pointed out to the Secretary that the word oil did not appear until the final page of his statement, and then only once. And I suggested that had it not been for oil, that there's no way on earth that any rational person would think that our forces would be where they are now, and the Congress would be on the brink of the kind of decision that we have to make now. Uh, I was not comforted by your response to Mr. Sharp and to Mr. Markey on the question of what is the worst possible scenario? We're now reading in the papers all kinds of figures about the worst possible scenario in terms of US casualties, in terms of lives lost and wounds incurred. But apparently, we're not going to be hearing, at least not from the administration, about what happens in the case of a major disruption of Saudi production. Uh, I don't know what happens. I'm not comforted by your factors in your report would say that, you know, the supply is okay now, but it's okay, thank goodness, because A, we have declining demand, which I think means we're in a recession. Dan, if I know why, that's good news. Uh, B, we have higher prices, self-evidently. And uh, C, we have warm winter weather this week or this month so far. That's nice, but I don't know about your agency, but I doubt that it can control that any more than the Congress can, and that's apt to uh, apt change. I frankly don't understand why you're not here saying to us what we must do forthwith and should have done a long time ago is to move towards reduced dependence, reduced and eventually elimination of the addiction to oil from the Middle East. Do you for one minute think that were it not for that addiction, for the West in general and, and us in particular in this instance, that we'd have half a million men and women in the Persian Gulf at the moment? Do you think of the principal product of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait were filbert nuts that we would have a half million troops over there right now? First embargo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Time the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes now the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. 
Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I was reviewing the uh, analysis on energy that was sent out by your department on August 21st, and the reason I'm interested in pursuing this line of questioning is to understand what changes may have been made in that. And you were talking about an SBR drawdown in the case of crisis of 3.5 million barrels per day uh, with a the earliest operative date would be 16 days from uh, a presidential decision, and that that policy would be in effect for three months. What what changes have been made since that report? Would you would you if you had to make a correction of that report? Is that your EIA report? That I'm, I'm not sure which report you're referring to, but I can tell you what's changed since August. But I've wanted to. Well, this is an August 21st report, and it's, I'm quoting that the uh, I'm quoting the U.S. SBR drawdown of as much as 3.5 million barrels per day for three months, uh, and it would be within 16 days of a presidential decision with a maximum rate within 30 days. What I'm trying to understand is uh, because of some testing of the SBR and so forth, has, has any of that changed? I think what, uh, if, if nothing else, the testing of the SPR has confirmed uh, our belief that we could meet the objectives stated in that report, that we could indeed draw out a three and a half million barrel uh, a day rate and, uh, and sustain it. Within 16 days? Yes. Uh, the, uh, let me review with you the, uh, the test sale. The test sale was uh, ordered by the President, the Secretary of Energy uh, directed it. The notice went out on the 28th of September. Uh, bids came in on the 5th of October. Uh, the successful bidders were notified on the 10th, and contracts were awarded uh, between the 16th and 18th of, uh, of uh, October. And oil actually started flowing the next day, uh, October 19th. So what? we're we're confident that the system does work uh, both procedurally and functionally. What do you, I mean, you've talked in your report, in your testimony about world production exceeding world demand and that the, there isn't uh, an equilibrium in effect. What, what in your view, is the, the war premium on oil today? Uh, what price range would you put on that? Well, I should probably uh, turn that over to the expert on uh, su supply and demand, Mr. Pettis from EIA, to, uh, to deal with that. It may be more within his area. What would you estimate the war premium be? Well, I think uh, at the current levels, you know, prices recently have been in the 24 to $27 barrel range, and we would expect the long-term equilibrium price absent the current events would have been probably low 20, so it's probably four to seven dollars. How so many how many barrels are you pumping? Are we pumping worldwide today? Uh, in the free market economies, it's about 54, 54. million barrels. 54 million barrels. So we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, a war premium of 200 to 300 million per day. Is that correct? I don't know if I can do the math quite well, that I mean, fast. Well, I mean, it's 54 but it's million barrels times four to seven dollars per day. Yeah, I mean, the point that I'm making here is that shouldn't the policy? I mean, we are on the verge of possible war. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? It seems to me that, in some respects, given the fragility of our banking system, the fragility of our economy, that if we, in fact, next week go to war, we're going to have one jolt to this free world economy, including our own. It seems to me that some thinking ought to be given to try and uh, mitigate that jolt. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it is beginning right now. Uh, the process of going into the SBR so that you take away uh, the war premium and it, the war premium, if negotiations are not fruitful, will obviously grow here in the next few days. I am very concerned about the perceptions here about what's happening to the world economy because of this world war premium. Uh, this war premium has been in effect now since August. <clears throat> It's causing a tremendous jolt. And some economists say maybe as much as $100 billion to the world economy. And I don't see a lot out there. I mean, what I'm seeing is a, a policy that in 16 days, maybe, maybe 30 days, 
we will be able to go into the SPR to the tune of 3.5 million barrels per day. Now, I'm, I'm very concerned about the jolt of the economy if, if, in fact, we do commence hostilities. And I just can be, um, be interested in comments on that. Well, I think there are a variety of, uh, of actions uh, underway and that can be taken to, to deal with this in the long-term strategic sense. Uh, First and foremost is the efforts that the administration and Secretary Baker are making to try to avert uh, uh, any hostilities and to resolve this crisis peacefully. Uh, secondly is, uh, from our department standpoint, is the, the effort that we've been undertaking now for the last year and a half to come up with a, a thoughtful, uh, well-reasoned, uh, analytical document that would set a strategy for this country over the next 40 years to uh, consider all sources of energy and uh, not become overly dependent on any, any one uh, particular source or any one particular type of fuel. Uh, in addition, we have very short-term measures that would uh, deal with the exigencies of the moment, such as the SPR, and it's not as much the it's not as much uh, putting the oil into the market as uh, announcing the intent uh, to do that. Uh, right now, for example, if all the facilities uh, that produced oil were taken, taken off the market, you still have a, a tremendous amount of oil in the high seas. For example, Iran and Saudi Arabia have over 100 million barrels uh, floating on the, on the high seas. So it's really not so much uh, when the oil starts being pumped from the SPR, but instead uh, the, the intention to use it and Admiral Watkins has signaled his intention, and um, I think we are prepared and committed to proceed with that. Well, let me just close there. In your estimated worst case earlier, you mentioned there may be a disruption of 2 to 2.3 billion a million barrels per day um, in earlier comments. It just seems to me that we've seen this crisis now for almost five, over five months, and by my math, that's a uh, a war premium of over $50 billion on the free world economy. And uh, I don't see a lot that has been done to temper that in any way, shape, or fashion. My concern as we approach the deadlines next week that this is going to continue to grow. And if hostilities break out, it's going to even be more severe. And I'm, just, I'm obviously uh, concerned about the fragility of our own economy as well as the free world's economy. Thank you, Chair. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair is going to recognize himself for questions. First, uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome back to the committee. You've been Thank here you. in earlier times when you were before you got into government. So we're happy to see you back here again. Thank you, sir. Mr. Secretary, under recent Supreme Court decisions, states have the authority to undertake price and allocation controls. Has the department discussed contingency actions with the states? Uh, and what kinds of policies are we liable to get at the state level? State set-asides, margin controls, uh, allocations, uh, or conservation measures? We have been in uh, touch on a daily basis with the states, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, had uh, also several meetings in addition to the daily uh, data flow back and forth. And in fact, uh, I meet with state officials this afternoon at 2 o'clock in yet one of our continuing meetings with state officials. And it's my understanding that uh, the states, uh, while they do possess this authority, and I think you have a state witness who will be appearing today, um, that generally they uh, do not see the, the uh, use of this authority uh, as a form of price or allocation. Uh, they see it. Uh, only is uh, available in a worst case scenario. And one of the th reasons that we meet so often with them is to make sure that we have removed as many bottlenecks as we can to preclude the necessity of having to use this. Under the Supreme Court decision, however, it is within the power of a state to deal with the matter in terms of allocation, retention of supply within the boundaries of the states, or to take other actions that might be inimical to an overall national plan. Am, am I correct under that, on that statement? I have uh, not thoroughly reviewed that, but I think uh, that's generally correct, Mr. Chairman. So it may be necessary then for the Department to come to the Congress to request certain authority to address those, those questions uh, to see to it that we have a national rather than a 50-state than a plan? Well, at the moment, we have a, uh, 
a potential use of authority, but I don't know that we've had a problem that needs being corrected. The fact that that authority exists but has not been used in any way adverse to the national economy uh, suggests that perhaps we, uh, we not uh, change that situation until there's a need to change it. Uh, is, legislated, is legislation needed to address the question of coordinating state actions, um, especially in view of the likelihood of conflicting state actions? Uh, does the department have the authority now to address conflicting state actions uh, if they occur, or do you need statutory authority for those matters? If conflicting state actions were to occur, um, the, I think the first you'd, you'd have the ability to go to court, but but would you win? Um, I hesitate as, a, as an attorney to predict whether I win or lose, but I uh, I don't know of any uh, strong basis that we would have uh, to uh, to uh, successfully challenge uh, the use of legitimate authorities that the states have. Hope you'll make a note of these. Uh, we will be submitting to you a a, a, a letter requesting information with regard to uh, your authority to uh, deal with matters on a contingency basis uh, and what authorities you will need in terms of legislation to address problems of the sort re referred to. Now, with regard to contingency plans, Mr. Secretary, if hostilities break out in the Persian Gulf, what does the department ha expect to happen to oil prices and supplies? I think supplies are adequate, and uh, if there were any disruption of supplies, uh, tankers failing to call, uh, that sort of thing, uh, that's precisely what the strategic and commercial stocks of uh, the United States and its allies are for, and we would recommend the immediate use of the SPR to offset any uh, further loss of supplies. I'd hesitate to predict uh, what happens about prices. prices uh, have seemed to have a mind of their own uh, based on what we, some people have called the war premium. Saudis have indicated they would close at least two fields which are close to Kuwait. Is that correct? Uh, I don't uh, think that's exactly correct. I think they have a variety of contingency plans uh, that uh, could be implemented <laughs> and uh, I don't know that they have made any definite decision. Now. Everybody in the administration that I have talked to indicates this is going to be a short and a quick war if it starts. If, if however, the uh, uh, war lasts a long time or the crisis is prolonged because of terrorism or destruction of uh, supply or distribution sources in the Gulf, uh, what will be the effects? What evaluation has the department made of such effects? Uh, that was the scenario we uh, tested in the second exercise that I described uh, toward the end of September. We looked at a disruption that occur could occur for uh, up to uh, one to two years. We looked at, uh, at the loss of uh, a great amount of oil uh, during that period of time. And uh, while there are certainly economic consequences that attend from that, uh, we do believe that uh, we have a variety of options uh, in the, uh, in the uh, IEA countries. It would not be just the United States. It would have to be uh, all 21, uh, soon to be 23 member countries of the IEA using all their uh, responses, which would include use of stocks, both commercial and uh, public stocks, uh, conservation measures, including in uh, those countries that have uh, have the authorities, uh, many of the European countries prefer to use demand restraints such as uh, speed limit, uh, driving on Sunday, things like that. <laughs> All those mechanisms uh, would have to be utilized. I uh, worry that our response to a major shutoff would be about the same as Marion Barry's response was to snow, and that was to trust in the Lord. And I, 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 we're, going to, we're going to be communicating with you, Mr. Secretary, to make sure that, 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 that I am in error with that, or, or if you were in error in it, that we, that we get down to the business of correcting it. Um, can you tell us what you have learned from the experience that you've undergone since last August, and what would be done differently in the administration with regard to the situation in the Middle East and the supply situation that's flowing from it? Well, obviously, one of the changes has been uh, our 
uh, use of the SPR. Uh, a number of your colleagues, number of members of this committee uh, felt very strongly when I first appeared uh, uh, in August, a few days after the invasion, that we should have been using the SPR at that time. Uh, we had a contrary view in the department. We wanted to see what the loss was and how it would be made up. And because of this uh, amount of stocks available prior to the invasion, we did not feel the time was appropriate. <laughs> Since that time, as you've uh, met with the secretary, you know that it's his intention to recommend the immediate use uh, should there be uh, uh, hostilities. Now, that's certainly a major, uh, a major weapon that we have to use. Uh, secondly, uh, as I mentioned before, and, and what we do in a long-term situation is we would draw on many of the demand restraint measures that the allied countries uh, have. The whole idea is to reduce uh, the disruption in world supplies. Oil is a fungible com uh, commodity that is marketed around the world, so anything that can be done in any country uh, ameliorates the impact in every other country. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My time's expired. Chair is going to recognize members for others who might choose uh, for questions. The chair will commence with the gentleman from uh, North Carolina, Mr. McMillan. Um, I just have one additional question. I don't think we've covered this. And uh, do you do you have an estimate of what the average cost per barrel um, to the government is for the removal of uh, of strategic petroleum stocks on, a, on an equivalent market basis. Uh, in other words, what is the incremental cost that we incur there? The results from both our, uh, our planning as well as uh, allocating the cost of this recent uh, test of the SPR indicate it's uh, less than 50 cents a barrel. That's the actual out-of-pocket cost of removal, then? That's correct. That's the uh, you know, added electricity that's used and the uh, personnel time and uh, those sorts of things. That's not bad. I would have thought it would have been uh, greater than that. Do we have a figure on the average laid-in cost of the stock themselves? I realize under government accounting we pay, we've paid for it, so it's not a current cost, I would assume. $27.60? It's about uh, the, the composite cost uh, over the years we've been filling. It's about $27 a barrel delivered to the SPR. 27 a barrel? Yes, sir. Hmm. We haven't exactly bought at the most favorable time then, have we? Unfortunately not. Yeah. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Mr. Chairman. I'm here. Time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Sharp. Go ahead. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Easton, your office has responsibility for a nuclear nonproliferation policy. Yes, and sir. As we know, in addition to oil, that is one of the all the primary reasons that the president states that we are over in that uh, part of the world and uh, with uh, hundreds of thousands of young men and women deployed. Um, and that uh, comes under your responsibility. Um, the President says that one of the reasons for going to war against Iraq is to prevent Saddam from getting the bomb. As you know, these efforts have taken place despite the fact that Iraq is a signatory uh, to the uh, nonproliferation treaties, which allows for International Atomic Energy Agency inspections uh, of the 12.5 milligrams of enriched uranium that is still in the Osirak reactor that was destroyed by the Israelis back in June of 1981. Doesn't the fact that Iraq has been able to pursue a covert nuclear weapons program while remaining a non-proliferation treaty signatory and allowing International Atomic Energy Agency inspection suggest that the current international re regime of safeguards is nothing more than a paper tiger uh, and that there has to be a dramatic reform of the International Atomic Energy Agency standards. I think the, uh, the United States has always felt that more could be done uh, within the safeguards area, Mr. Markey. Uh, we have always uh, pressed with all of uh, in all our nuclear 
nonproliferation bilaterals for full scope safeguards rather than some of the limited safeguards uh, that, that exist. And I think that's an area where significant improvement can be made. Uh, we, as a, as a country, have worked on uh, that with the IEA, IAEA, excuse me, and uh, that would be an area where we would uh, continue to press for strengthening the safeguards regime. We think that's very important. Have you made any recommendations to the President in the last five months with regard to how we could um, strengthen our domestic and international uh, safeguards to uh, dampen the likelihood of nuclear proliferation? Uh, I have not, uh, our department has not. Uh, Nonproliferation policy, of course, is a function of several departments in the, in the government and uh, largely within State Department. Have you made and, any recommendations? No, I have not. Okay. I guess the, the problem, Mr. Easton, is if you can go back to your whole humming, that the whole humming on energy policy is matched by the whole humming on nuclear nonproliferation policy, and that it really isn't out of boredom, it's more out of exasperation that those of us who have sat on this committee over this past decade have had to witness this uh, blind eye turn to the need for us to have the tight kind of sanctions that uh, will ensure that American young men and women won't have to be put in these kind of situations. And what we've wound up with is rather than having worked smarter, that is having put in place an energy policy, put in place a nonproliferation policy that can protect us, instead uh, American young men are going to have to work harder and maybe die harder uh, in order to uh, now uh, make up for the lack of an anticipatory uh, policy. Um, in conclusion, I would ask you, do you think we ought to have a policy where only low-enriched uranium should be uh, uh, in international commerce and that we make that the international standard henceforth and that we just get out of the business of having any highly enriched uranium in world commerce? Our department has long supported the uh the low enriched uranium program in uh, research and test reactors it, uh, and we have continued to work to develop uh, make sure we could develop the appropriate leu fuel that could be used and then go ahead and convert those reactors but you don't think it should happen now oh it is happening now no we, do you think that ought to just be the standard today no more new highly enriched uranium in international commerce and we just put a ban on it because we understand now on looking at saddam what the consequences are and allowing these kind of materials out in world commerce. Before I would say, uh, let's put a ban on it, I would have to understand uh, how, how we would do that and how effective that would be. So I'd rather uh, respond to you in writing, if I may, so that we can consider whether that would be an effective mechanism. That's, uh, to me, uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to come to grips with, obviously, and I recognize the problem you've got. We've had a lot of discussion this morning about uh, the cost of acting decisively uh, in the Gulf in, rela in relation to uh, energy policy. Uh, I wonder if you could just briefly give us uh, your scenario of the price of not acting decisively uh, in the Gulf and the prospect of uh, someone like Saddam uh, controlling 40 plus percent of the known uh, world oil reserves and what effect that would have uh, on uh, our uh, national economy, what effect it would have on uh, those um, uh, people in uh, Boston and Ohio and other places uh, in regards to what they would end up paying for uh, energy, not only in home heating oil but uh, in uh, gasoline as well. You raise a very good point. They're not only the the economic consequences of undeterred aggression, uh, but obviously other far greater consequences as well. So I'll limit myself just to the economic consequences, uh, even though perhaps there would be even more destabilizing uh, uh, results if that uh, aggression were not deterred. Certainly in the e economic area, if, uh, if uh, Saddam Hussein were con to control Iraq, Kuwait, and had pushed into Saudi Arabia, that would be roughly 50 percent of the world's oil reserves and uh, perhaps a little bit less of the current world's oil production. Uh, despite our attempts in this country and perhaps other countries to wean ourselves of oil, 
uh, oil still remains a very vital element of the world's economy. Uh, we have seen the impact uh, on some of the developing countries in the world, uh, in Asia, in Eastern Europe, uh, as they emerge to new democracies, uh, and certainly in Latin America, of the impact of, of higher oil prices. If you were to allow one person to control virtually half of the reserves of the world, uh, I'm, there's no guess as to what the uh, consequences of that might be. Uh, certainly, it uh, is a far greater uh, price to pay, I'm afraid, and uh, that uh, would be, I think, unacceptable to most of us to allow that sort of control in uh, any one person's hands. Well, I think that's a good point. I mean, it, it is, uh, it's obviously easy to criticize uh, those in positions to have to make some tough decisions, and indeed they are tough decisions. We're going to have to make some tough decisions over the next uh, several days uh, here in the Congress, as it should be. Uh, but at the same time, I think we have to contemplate the consequences of, of inaction or non-action or undecisive, uh, indecisive action uh, in that area and what it would mean. Uh, and I suspect that many of the same people who are uh, uh, complaining and concerned about uh, resources available and the cost of those uh, sources of energy uh, would be the first ones that would be uh, uh, complaining about uh, availability and cost uh, should the uh, cost of inaction uh, bring that to, to the forefront. So I ap appreciate uh, your comments. Let me just ask one last question, if I can, to Mr. Pettis. Mr. Pettis, you said that increased production to offset the oil loss from Iraq and Kuwait will be sufficient through the first quarter of this year. Uh, elsewhere, EIA has said that uh, such uh, offsetting production will be sufficient through June of, uh, of 1991. Uh, what happens after June uh, uh, 2nd, or what happens after June of 1991? Is your estimate that surge production will continue beyond June at the current levels, or do you have any uh, indication as to what those surge levels might be? Uh, yes, sir, we do. Uh, if you'll give me just one second. I It, it looks like we would be glad to provide this for the record if you'd like, but it looks like through the end of 1991 that that production could be above the 4.3 million barrel day loss of, of Iraq and Kuwait. So that uh, your figures only go through this year, is that correct, or your, your estimates? That's the estimates that I had here in front of me, yes, that's okay. correct. Okay, so you, it would be sufficient then for the second half of 1991 based on the numbers that you've got? That's correct. One other question, if I could, Mr. Chairman. There have been some uh, early on discussions that uh, perhaps the oil uh, from Venezuela uh, would be um, inadequate uh, in terms of quality uh, to make up uh, part of the difference uh, in the loss uh, from the Gulf. Um, was that a fear unfounded, or has your evidence indicated that uh, the Venezuelan oil is of sufficient quality to uh, provide? Uh, the necessary crude uh, for our needs as well as uh, other countries? Well, some of the Venezuelan crude is a, of a heavier uh, type crude. Uh, it, it does appear that the increases from Venezuela have been on the order of 250,000 barrels a day. So I think earlier on, some people were estimating that they might increase production up to 400,000 barrels a day. So it's possible that some of that uh, crude may not have been marketable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Can I just ask uh, you, Mr. Chairman, uh, a uh, unanimous consent request? The chair will recognize the gentleman. In, yes. Well, the chair is going to recognize the gentleman from Mr. Indiana. Mr. Chairman, let me yield. Can I ask unanimous consent request through the chair that we um, ask for a classified um, briefing? Uh, from the Department of Energy on the um, uh, question of where oil prices will go during the worst case scenarios of, uh, of a uh, armed conflict in the uh, Persian Gulf area. Without objection, so ordered. And, uh, and as well, I have a, a series of additional questions on nonproliferation, which I would like to have answered in writing by the Department of Energy. Um, uh, pursuant to the GAO report that uh, Mr. Dingle and I have requested from the uh, Government Accounting 
uh, office on the loss of tritium at the Oak Ridge facility and the implications in terms of an international regi regime for safeguards uh, on tritium. Thank you. Without objection, sir. Gentleman from Indiana. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just want to make a, a couple brief remarks to the Secretary while we have him here. Tomorrow you'll go, uh, if I understand it, to meet with the IEA one more time. And I strongly urge that first here at home we make it absolutely clear through the President that we will use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve upon the outbreak of uh, of hostilities because every action will be taken here to protect the American economy and and also the world economy as the result of that. Uh, and that we expect and we ought to elicit the commitment from the Japanese and the German and others, but those are the key players, uh, that they will participate in that immediately. I think this would be very useful to the President at this point uh, in his diplomacy uh, and his uh, efforts uh, with Mr. Uh, Saddam Hussein right now. Uh, and I think it's uh, an important policy to engage in the real world. Uh, so I strongly urge that that, that be done. Secondly, uh, Mr. Secretary, we, most of us didn't engage in uh, questions on the national energy strategy, uh, but uh, certainly uh, we've been discussing with people at your department and want to reiterate here that we intend to move on a number of fronts uh, on energy policy in the committee. Uh, we hope to do that as cooperatively as we can with the administration, and we want to have their recommendations as quickly as we can. And I will one more time reiterate, I trust and hope that we will receive back from you strong recommendations on efficiency and conservation as well as on production. But uh, I think that we want to uh, move while uh, the public, the media, ourselves, and everyone else understand, again, the significance of uh, uh, better preparation on energy. Thank you. Time the gentleman has expired. Ms. Secretary. Uh, the United States has agreement with virtually all the free world with regard to sharing of oil shortages. Uh, that is done under the International Energy Agency. I gather that we have agreements, for example, to supply Israel with 100 percent of their needs. Uh, without Detailing or giving us any answer at this time, I'd like you to submit for the record a statement of how that will impact. That, that, that will be in the record, Mr. Secretary. You don't need to make a note of it. Um, because that, uh, I, I'm of the view that we have not yet fully considered the impact or the implication of that. Now, would you submit to the committee also for the record what are the plans for an emergency? For example, oil back out by substitution of fuels, conservation. Uh, coordination with the states, state action, federal state uh, coordination, as I had mentioned, uh, the ability to recruit uh, personnel from the uh, oil and energy and other industries to help administer federal programs in the event. I gather you're going to need some statutory authority on that. Uh, so if you would submit those, those for the records. Now, Mr. Secretary, I have a great deal of concern here that um, we have not been coordinating as well with our allies as we should have with regard to the energy front. Uh, have, first of all, would you submit for the record a statement as to what we have done with regard to coordination with regard to our friends and allies around the world? The uh, chair has received reports that Japan has increased its stocks during the crisis. Is that a correct statement? There is a uh, divided opinion in the uh, within our own department as to the status of, of stocks we're I gather the Japanese that. got very distressed at the department went to the State Department because uh, because your agency had made comments that they may have been increasing their stocks during during this period I know they did on they, they have done it in connection with earlier uh, world shortfalls in supply we are uh, currently analyzing and we have about f three or four elements within the department that have some expertise in this area to try to figure out just what the real story is and what further information we might need in order to be to come up with a conclusive determination. Are other nations increasing their stocks? Larry, I don't. Uh, well, information on international stocks is not real timely. We. Uh, uh, but there's, I think there is some evidence or some expectations that because of the increases in productions, there may have actually been some stock builds that occurred in this last quarter. Uh, part of that is uh, by the producing countries, even Saudi Arabia and Iran, or certainly there are estimates that they have built stocks at sea and on land during this period of time. 
Now, Mr. Pettis, you have just said there's some information. One of the reasons, and I'm, one of the, I'm the sole remaining author of the Energy Information Agency requirements of the Department of, uh, that's the Department of, of, of Energy that were included in the original uh, authorizing legislation. And you have just said something I find distressing because I'd like more than just there is some evidence. I'd like you to be able, as speaking on behalf of the Energy Information Agency, to give us a flat yes or no and to tell us what the facts are. One of the things that I've felt of late, and I've got to be very truthful in this, as I say with some regret, is that, that uh, the Energy Information Agency has never been understood, never been appreciated, and that the administration has consistently sought to uh, ignore or even curtail its abilities to, to ignore the agency or to curtail its abilities to address the problem because of budgetary or other reasons. And, and, and that we, and you, your agency was set up, and I say this to you, Mr. Secretary, as well as Mr. Pettis, was set up to be able to give quick, responsive, informative, and valuable answers to questions of the kind that I just asked, rather than to have me say there, there rather than have you tell me, well, there's some evidence. Um, I'm also distressed because I detect that our cooperation with regard to the energy, uh, the International Energy Agency, which is supposed to be a major uh, focus for the free world nations in terms of having information with regard to supply and demand figures and who's doing what in the whole area, uh, has not been sufficient or adequate. As a result, we find ourselves, again, without the ability to know what's going on in the world. Because if nations are stockpiling during times of shortage, that's going to impact prices on the world. And it tends to flow against the agreements we have with our friends and so-called friends around the world about what they're going to do about oil supply and oil pricing in times of crisis. Um, would you submit us a, a full response to those questions, please, for the record? Now, uh, I, I should say that uh, perhaps one of the reasons we were both a little tentative in this is partly because of the uh, slowness of, of the lag time for reporting uh, from any source. Secondly, that the EIA does not have authority to collect data from other countries. Uh, we depend on the IEA for, for that. And then the IEA uh, does monitor that. We do know through the IEA what the stock uh, situation is, but nevertheless, there is a bit of a lag time, to, and then there get to be questions, uh, are they building crude, are they building product, uh, and what is the cause of that? And do you call a stock, do you call it building stocks when perhaps worldwide stocks increase because producing countries simply aren't able to sell them. The, the fact that Iran and Iraq have approximately 100 million barrels on the high seas right now unsold. So it's, it's much more complicated than just being able to say yes or no. <coughs> I understand that, and, I, and I'm, I'm willing to give you some of the benefit of the doubt on this matter, Mr. Secretary. Now, can you tell us, um, well, the Chair is going to submit to you a, a, a very lengthy letter of questions to, to respond so that we have in the record the, the questions, but I would like to address these. Under an optimistic scenario, we would uh, undertake offensive actions against Iraq, and the war, we assume, would be limited in scope and durations. Uh, if we assume that there's uh, little or no terrorism and we're successful in the month, uh, would there be a shutdown of some Saudi production, if only for precautionary reasons? And uh, what would be the uh, practical result in terms of prices, the good and the bad scenario? Uh, would the rises be temporary? Would the situation be manageable? Now, I'm, could you give us a quick answer and then give us a more full answer for the record, please? I certainly will. I think uh, the most optimistic scenario is, is, is peace. That's certainly the most optimistic scenario. Should hostilities erupt, um, uh, we do not see any military threat to Saudi facilities. Uh, Saudis uh, have a variety of contingency plans. I can't state uh, uh, unequivocally that uh, it's that uh, there would be no further interruption. Uh, there, but we do believe there's certainly no military threat to those facilities. So the question is, would tankers call uh, in in the event of hostilities, things like that. The impact of price, uh, unfortunately, is still anybody's guess. Uh, you can read the trade press. You can look at what uh, some of the smartest analysts are saying, and you see ranges from there shouldn't be any impact because of the sufficiency of oil to uh, it could go $30, $40, $50. Uh, 
everybody has an opinion. It's, it's somewhat like trying to predict the weather to try to predict what will happen to prices. Uh, our our goal already, is to. It's already hit forty dollars, Mr. Secretary. Well, this is from where we are now to what might happen should there be hostilities. Uh, there, you'll see analysts that are saying it uh, might go up uh, several dollars to those who think it would go up more. What we're trying to let the American public and the American people uh, uh, know is what, the, is what the industry knows, and that is uh, the information we gave to you this morning. The world has plenty of oil at the moment. We do not see a threat to, uh, to Saudi facilities or sh Saudi production. Uh, there's 100 million barrels unsold in the high seas. Uh, there's the use uh, of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and that of our allies. So there are all sorts of mechanisms available uh, and, and, f and factors out there that should prevent some skyrocketing of prices. There doesn't need to be uh, this huge run-up in prices. I gather that one of the important uh, tools in, in this uh, tool chest of ours is prayer. Um, and again, I reiterate that I'm, the, the pricing situation appears to be tied very closely to the policies that Marion Barry had with regard to uh, snow removal in Washington, D.C. Trust the Lord. And I, let me ask you, what do you have in the way of agreements with, with uh, other nations with regard to coordinated drawdowns? The agreements are through the International Energy Program, the IE, the program that connects all the IEA member countries. Do you have formal agreements on this with our, with our sister nations? It's, they're not a bilateral agreement. It's, it's the way each country, when it joins the IEA, submits to the conditions of membership and participation in the IEA. And well, there are, major, there, are major, there are major strategic petroleum reserves in the United States, Germany, and in uh, Japan. Japan. Do we have any understandings with either of those two countries with regard to drawdowns, the rate at which the drawdowns would occur, whether they would be coordinated, when they would occur, and whether there would be uh, cooperation between the United States in terms of the policy decisions that would be made jointly on these matters? We do in the sense that uh, as part of the emergency planning mechanism of the IEA, uh, each country has made its responses to a variety of disruption scenarios, uh, has submitted those responses. And so we know from, from the responses that have been offered up through the Standing Group on Emergency Questions how countries will respond to a variety of scenarios. That's their commitment to the IEA. And Mr. Secretary, is the answer no or maybe? The answer is uh, stocks will be used by uh, both the, the countries you mentioned. The amount depends on the type of disruption. Let's assume here, Mr. Secretary, that the scenario is less optimistic. There are terrorism. Uh, there, the war is not of limited scope or duration. Uh, terrorism uh, gets fairly expansive. Uh, under such scenarios, would our st st strategic petroleum reserve be enough? Do we have agreements with the Japanese and the Germans that would induce them to cooperate with us in terms of both seeing to it that our joint reserves went on the world marketplace uh, in a coordinated fashion in a way which would best assure both supply and uh, moderation of, of, upward prices, uh, of upward pressures on prices. One of the reasons the IEA countries have not yet uh, utilized their stocks is the feeling that uh, the answer to such a question depends on the market conditions and the world conditions as exist at the time of the specific event. And so to, to say it's impossible to model every possible event, so the thought of the IEA was let's come up with some broad ranges of disruptions and find out what our commitment would be under those. And then in an event such as you describe, we see whether that fits one of those disruption scenarios or whether, we have, whether it takes additional responses further than that that has been planned. Does the department have adequate authority, uh, both in terms of statutory uh, to ensure that uh, there are adequate supplies, that uh, we can manage the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that we can assure that there are adequate supplies for essential services or defense needs. I'm confident that the authorities with respect to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve are adequate. We have uh, indicated that we see some uh, uh, improvements needed in the Defense Production Act. You have no authority, however, under the law 
uh, since the allocation and price control authorities have expired to address these questions. How would you deal, how would you deal with the problems if, if the situation in the Middle East becomes severe? Would you use Defense Production Act? Is it adequate? Or would you use some different statute? As I've indicated, we'd certainly use the authorities under the SPR. We would also want to see, uh, and I think the SPR permits you to put, put it on the market. It yes, permits sir. you to sell it. Now, under the law, you can sell it to anybody, including the Saudis, or for that matter, the Iraqis. We have uh, export control laws to... Uh, beg pardon? There's a regimen of export control laws administered by the Commerce Department to prevent the export of that uh, SPR oil. I've, I have observed those laws, and, Mr. Secretary, your comment on them doesn't give me much comfort. This committee stopped the shipment of a, uh, of, of a group of high-temperature furnaces, which were usable for, make, for the manufacture of uh, nuclear explosive devices and intercontinental ballistic missile warheads. Uh, and we did it at 3 o'clock prior to... Uh, the midnight expiration of the, of the restraint on those shipments. It was done because of personal relationship between Secretary Mossbacher and myself and not because of the fact that the, that the controls either at the hands of the State Department or at the hands of the Defense Department were in fact working. Uh, does the Department require any additional authority to deal with the uh, uh, IEA formula to share oil? Uh, does it need any additional legislative authority to address the question with regard to uh, our cooperation with our, with our uh, friends and allies? Does it require any uh, allocation or other authority to address uh, the, the uh, problems that we would have with regard to major shortfalls in terms of domestic supply? I believe our authorities internationally are adequate under the uh, recently approved EPCA. Uh, we have not found any deficiency there that would hamper us in the IEA or dealing with our allies. Would you give me a, a firm statement on that, if you please, Mr. Secretary, for the record? Um, Mr. Secretary, the chair will submit to you uh, a, a lengthy question, um, a questionnaire to, to respond to for purposes of the record. We uh, thank you, Mr. Sure. Pettis, for your very kind assistance to the committee. Gentlemen, thank Thanks. you both. The chair announces that the next witnesses are a panel composed of Mr. Charles R. Ginn, Deputy Commissioner, New York State Energy Office, Mr. Charles J. DeBona, President, American Petroleum Institute, Mr. R. Patrick Thompson, President, New York Mercantile Exchange, and Mr. Edward A. Merlis, Vice President, Air Transport Association. Gentlemen, we, are, we appreciate your presence here and your assistance to the committee. The uh, in view of the uh, time problem that, that you and we uh, confront, the chair is going to request that you uh, submit your full statements for purposes of the record, limit your uh, presentation to five minutes, and then we'll get down to questions. Uh, we will start first with Mr. DeBona, then Mr. Ginn, then Mr. Thompson, and finally Mr. Merlis. Uh, that is, the chair wants you to know um, um, an arbitrary decision by the chair and does not necessarily reflect uh, in any way, the, the relative importance of our three, of, of our four uh, witnesses. Gentlemen, uh, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to appear at this briefing to assess oh. the nation's readiness concerning potential oil supply interruptions. Mr. Gaboni, you're going to find that we have the worst acoustics and the worst public address system in the whole of the United States in this room. Yep. It is an absolute engineering triumph. So we're going to ask you to speak loudly so that we can all hear what you say. I noticed that when I was sitting back there. <laughs> uh, it's vitally important that we avoid the mistakes of the past where both federal and state government intervention through price and allocation controls exacerbated supply shortfalls and their economic impact. Instead, we should rely on market forces to efficiently balance supply and demand. Strategic petroleum reserve oil should be used as appropriate to supplement supplies and consultation and coordination should be maintained with IEA members as well as other allies. Following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait on August 2nd, oil exports from these countries are embargoed, removing about 4.3 million barrels per day from world markets. 
Spot market prices reacted quickly and prices have gyrated on every bit of news and rumor about the Middle East situation. Yet the U.S. government resisted the temptation to intervene in oil markets, thus allowing markets to balance supply and demand efficiently. Uh, as a result, additional supplies have been brought on. Fuel conservation is taking place, and I, and I must say quite dramatically, and prices have moderated. No one has ended up in gasoline lines. In the six weeks prior to the August 2nd invasion, world crude prices increased by over 10 cents per gallon, while gasoline prices did not rise at all. Despite this sharp drop in gasoline margins before the invasion, retail gasoline prices after the invasion increased by much less than crude oil prices. For example, between August 2nd and the end of September, the spot price for crude oil rose by 44 cents per gallon, but the retail gasoline price rose by only 24 cents a gallon. In fact, the Energy Information Agency, in its analysis of the 90 days following the invasion, observed that uh, through the middle of October, the increase at the retail level were less than would have been indicated by the change in crude or spot gasoline prices. While it's true that crude oil prices have fallen sharply since their peak, gasoline prices have fallen considerably as well. 19 cents per gallon since the middle of November, excluding the 5 cents per gallon increase in the federal gasoline excise tax on December 1st. Thus, five months after the invasion, gasoline prices still have not caught up with crude oil prices. From the middle of June to early January, crude prices were up 29 cents per gallon, while retail gasoline prices, excluding tax increases, were up less than 11 cents, and now I guess it's only nine. Although we ha there are many scenarios that could unfold in the Middle East, we can take comfort in the fact that current stocks of crude and products are generally at or above normal levels, and the SBR contains a substantial cushion. What actions should we consider in the event of a new supply disruption? One, price and allocation controls should not be imposed. The nation's experience in the 70s conclusively demonstrated that price and allocation controls are counterproductive. Two, state price and allocation programs should be preempted. A market-based policy should apply not only on the federal level, but in the states as well. Again, in the disruptions of the 70s, state price and allocation programs inhibited the efficient functioning of the market. Federal preemption of counterproductive state price and allocation programs must be uh, provided. Three, changes in the antitrust and conflict of interest statutes are necessary to allow cooperation and consultation between government and industry. Federal and private sector consultation and cooperation is essential to an effective response to a supply situation. Advisory committees, the National Defense Executive Reserve Units, voluntary agreements and plans of action are just a few of the means for such consultation and cooperation. The industry stands ready to provide help and insight whenever the government seeks it to the extent that the law permits. A necessary ingredient to such consultation is the provision of clear and comprehensive legal protection for industry person personnel and their companies from the antitrust and conflict of interest laws that currently inhibit such consultation. Four, several other areas should be scrutinized to determine whether the flow of oil could be impeded. For example, the SBR can be an important supply source, but improved waiver provisions for non-Jones Act tankers may be needed to ensure the prop transport of SPR oil. It is likely that there will be an insufficient number of Jones Act tankers to carry uh, SPR oil. It's, it's almost certain there will be. Procedures should be developed to expedite review of tanker availability and to rapidly issue waivers during periods of actual or imminent oil supply shortages. Summary. Reauthorization of the Defense Production Act was not completed prior to adjournment last year. In light of the current situation in the Middle East, DPA author reauthorization must be addressed promptly. Due to the need for coordinated efforts by industry and government, in a broad range of circumstances, not just military mobilization. And due to the many congressional committees with jurisdiction over DPA, it may be preferable to address the antitrust and conflict of interest concerns, as well as preemption of state price and allocation authority through an amendment of the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Ms. Ginn? 
Today I am appearing on behalf of the National Association of State Energy Officials. And first I would like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your action in the passage of 2088, especially the provisions which permit uh, RPRs to be established. Had we had them, we'd be in a lot better shape than we are right now. Also, to thank you for the passage of the State Energy Efficiency Programs Implementation Act of 1990, which among other things, establishes a mandate that states be engaged in energy emergency activities. Regarding the preparedness of the states, we have maintained our energy emergency expertise in our energy offices through the 80s, which was no mean feat. We have, as John Easton pointed out earlier, been involved in several tabletop exercises with DOE and the industry. Also, individual states in preparing for this winter and as a result of the invasion have met with its energy suppliers to make sure we're prepared for what might happen. We've been working closely with the Federalist officials with regard to the data. As of October, all but two of the states and territories had energy emergency plans in place. A vast majority of these plans have recently been updated, and most of the remaining plans are currently under revision. Generally speaking, each energy emergency plan includes measures which ensure interagency, local, and industry coordination, as well as a step-by-step -step instructions for the implementation of the plan in the event of an energy emergency. Generally, set-aside programs are the major response measure available to the states in a severe emergency and should be broadly supported. Set-aside programs are not broad price and allocation control programs. Set-asides allow the market to operate and merely ensure that high priority users or regional shortages and hardships are addressed. We do not support federal preemption of state authority in the area of energy emergency preparedness. We include in this category proposals dating back to 1984 for prior presidential approval for state set-aside authority. On the question of price controls, the states generally have not been supportive of price controls. According to DOE, only six states currently have the state statutory authority to improve such price controls. However, we are concerned that low-income Americans will be deeply affected by a war-induced price increase. LIHEAP must be increased, not cut as proposed by HHS. The states, due to last winter's propane and heating oil problems, have closely monitored supply and price prior to the invasion and certainly with great interest since. Stocks except for jet fuel are above normal. Prices appear to be abnormal. What we're dealing with is a war-induced specula uh, war speculation and some ideas on how to manage that speculation. The states generally believe that the president should announce the release of the SPRO quickly if war occurs. It would be in our nation's best interest to begin the bidding process at once. DOE must achieve a coordinated IEA dra drawdown to avoid the U.S. becoming the sole provider of the strategic crude oil stocks. The federal government should carefully monitor activities on the New York Mercantile Exchange. The Merck has already imposed new restrictions on daily spot price increases, and the success or failure of these restrictions should be carefully scrutinized by the Commodities Future Trading Commission. The CFTC should impose tighter restrictions on daily spot month price changes now and be ready to impose greater margin requirements quickly in the event of war. The Jones Act waiver should be given top priority. This is not a time, this is a time for action, not bureaucratic quibbling. Hopefully, the administration has lined up the necessary tools to quickly act. Regarding national preparedness, we should consider suspending the Jones Act for all SPR deliveries now, as some of the speakers before have pointed out. Regarding the national preparedness, we are probably more prepared for a brief shortfall of Saudi crude oil production in light of present inventories than the loss of refining capacity or distribution infrastructure through accidents or terrorism. We should be concerned that we must deal with 
a situation that is different than simply balancing Saudi production with an SPR drawdown. We must be testing problems which may occur in our refining and our distribution system due to terrorism. Finally, in conclusion, NASIO believes that the states are prepared to handle the effects of an energy emergency resulting from hostilities in the Middle East. Through regional coordination, cooperation with the Office of Energy Emergencies and the Energy Information Administration and the Commodities Future Trading Commission, we hope that domestic price and supply problems can now be managed better than they have been in the past. Congress should act immediately to restore the President's energy emergency powers through the passage of the Defense Production Act. Further, we strongly endorse an emergency supplemental low-income home assistance program appropriation to mitigate the impact of higher heating costs on the low income in the event of war. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ginn. Um, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly would like to uh, extend my thanks to the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you today and part participate in the briefing. We have submitted our, our written testimony, and uh, be, because it is extensive and the exhibits are extensive, I'll try to limit my, uh, my comments to the main points made in, in our brief. The first is, is that prices that have uh, been reported on the exchange have been very representative over this entire period with respect to cash market conditions and transactions. The conditions include not only supply and demand, as uh, can be worked out through mathematical formulations of, of uh, consumption as well as uh, supplies on hand, but also the industry's analysis and preparation for the potential changes that may occur to future supply and demand uh, relationships. The second point which I would like to make also is that the futures market positions, which we monitor on a daily basis as well as the CFTC, to an overwhelming degree at a point now approaching over 90 percent on both the long and the short side of the market, uh, are held by commercial participants, those who produce or refine or distribute uh, or and otherwise have market risk to the physical products of oil and are not held by speculators. Less than 10 percent of the market, and probably now approaching maybe 6 to 7 percent of the market, open positions are held by speculators. And that number has been declining over this entire crisis. The third point is that the functions which are performed by the futures market, that is that price discovery and risk shifting uh, occurs through the, the use of futures trading, is even more important now in the current environment. Price volatility has been extreme over this entire period of time, and the price risk taken by those in the industry who have to handle the physical commodity in their, their normal business are higher than they've ever been in, in any recent memory. It's very important under those conditions to maintain an open and viable futures market so that those risks uh, can be shifted to the market among its participants, whether they be speculators or uh, those in the industry. And the final point, I think, which is very important, is, is to focus on the fact that the exchange has acted over this period of time through a great deal of study, which took place over a period of, of nearly four months, to develop and implement uh, a plan which is designed to deal with sudden large movements in the markets. <clears throat> excuse me, through a combination of circuit breakers and price limits. During this period of time, we have, we have raised margins continuously and adjusted them in relation to the volatility of the market prices, as our analyses show. And through this, we have maintained the integrity of the market, both its financial integrity as well as the public confidence of the industry in using the market as its hedging mechanisms. The, the circuit breakers, which we recently implemented on uh, an emergency basis because uh, it was required to go through a CFTC approval process before final implementation of final rules, um, provide for 
an ability for the exchange not only to limit uh, on a daily basis spot market uh, movements or spot month movements in the futures contracts, but also to permit a period of time for the market uh, to cease trading so that information that may have affected the, the movements of prices on that day can be assimilated uh, by the market. We, we believe very, very strongly that the use of, of uh, well-founded information is very, very important to trading decisions made by those who use the market for their hedging needs. And we hope through these circuit breakers to permit uh, the market to more easily assimilate uh, the information to to uh, to better understand what conditions have changed market prices during the day so that the trading decisions can be more informed and uh, at the conclusion I'll be happy to take your questions thank you thank you very much Ms. Thompson Ms. Merlis Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm Edward Merlis, Vice President, Policy and Planning of the Air Transport Association of America. ATA member airlines collectively account for approximately 97 percent of the revenue passenger miles flown in the United States and over 95 percent of the freight ton miles. The airlines are hemorrhaging due to the combined impact of a recession and drastically increased fuel costs. Fuel represents our second largest item of expense, amounting on average to about 18 percent of total operating costs. Two major carriers have filed for bankruptcy within the last 35 days. For the first time in its modern history, the industry had a substantial net loss in the heretofore always profitable third quarter. We anticipate industry net losses will total $2 billion for the full year 1990, and for the six months consisting of the fourth quarter 90, first quarter 91, we anticipate losses of nearly $2.5 billion, not taking into account changes in fuel supply and costs which may occur after January 15th. Previous fuel shocks pale by comparison to the magnitude and suddenness of the current crisis. In 1979, jet fuel was 57 cents per gallon, and it took two years to reach over a dollar per gallon. This year, it took two months. In August, our fuel cost was 63 cents per gallon. By the middle of October, it was $1.39. Unfortunately, this run-up has occurred in spite of an abundance of crude oil and relatively large inventories of jet fuel. Prices for jet fuel have skyrocketed far in excess of prices for other refined petroleum products and far in excess of what one would anticipate from the orderly working of a marketplace governed by supply and demand. In my t written testimony, there are several charts. Uh, if you just take a look at the last page chart, uh, demonstrates that between August and December, the jet fuel price relationship to gasoline went from jet fuel costing 10 cents a gallon less than gasoline to currently costing 14 cents a gallon more than gasoline, a net change of 24 cents. We cannot afford this disproportionate share of the increase in crude oil. We consume 16 billion gallons of jet fuel each year. Consequently, a one cent increase in jet fuel results in a $160 million increase in costs. There have been published reports that the cost of jet fuel has increased due to several factors concerning the loss of Kuwaiti refineries, reduced quality of crudes, and military operations. Unfortunately, our experience and review of the, of the facts indicates that the suggested causes, while valid to some extent, do not uh, bear the margins of cost increase which we have faced. We believe the jet fuel price spiral is related to the publicity surrounding gasoline price increases and the airline's inability to adjust schedules quickly. Consumers see the price of gasoline in two-foot-tall numbers as they drive down the street. They do not see the price of jet fuel. Consumers can alter their driving and buying practices by carpooling, using public transportation, forsaking for frequent short trips and buying lower octane gasoline to save money. Jet fuel consumption, on the other hand, is relatively inelastic. About two dozen customers buy 95 percent of the jet fuel sold in this country in order to maintain their scheduled 19,000 flights per day. Since the last oil crisis, and especially since deregulation, the carriers have introduced a number of fuel-saving steps. Because they have been so diligent in making these improvements in fuel efficiency, there is very little room left for further improvements. Overall, airline fuel efficiency has improved by 47 percent since 1974. Now to the real subject of this hearing, what steps can be taken should there be a supply interruption? First of all, we need a contingency plan. Our economic health has already been severely damaged. 
We cannot afford to watch our already weakened financial condition deteriorate while the government contemplates the fuel situation. We need to obtain approximately 1.4 million barrels per day of jet fuel from our usual suppliers at the rates customarily paid. That means no price controls, no allocation rules, and no unwarranted interference in the marketplace. At the moment, our knowledge of contingency plans is limited to what we've read in the newspapers. Energy Secretary Watkins is said to have a plan, and we heard this morning, to request the President launch an immediate drawdown of the strategic petroleum reserves. If the production increases which have been made up for by the elimination of Kuwait and Iraq supplies are not sustained, particularly those increases flowing from Saudi Arabia, the reduced production can only be made up from strategic stockpiles. And ensuring an adequate supply is the key to moderating the price increases which would otherwise occur with the outbreak of war. Although we've taken the hit for the price increases and probably will continue to, if availability of jet fuel is adversely affected by the outbreak of hostilities, several competitive dis severe competitive dislocations will occur in the airline industry. An immediate and sustained drawdown of the strategic petroleum reserves is a crucial component of any plan to assure continued availability of petroleum, price petroleum products at somewhat affordable prices. Other components of such a plan should include restricting the ability of local authorities to allocate transportation transportation fuels away from transportation uses and restricting the exportation of refined petroleum products. Lastly, intensified monitoring of speculative activity in the commodities markets to detect and prevent profiteering is another component of a balanced plan to ensure the continued viability of the transportation sector during the period of supply interruption. Other government actions or the failure of the government to take these actions are likely to result in even more adverse economic consequences than will occur due to the interruption of crude oil supply. I would like to emphasize the importance of prompt and decisive action on any decision to use the strategic reserves. The mechanism by which prices are set in the marketplace has changed since 1973. Neither the Seven Sister Oil Companies nor the OPEC ministers set prices anymore. Rather, it is the action taken in the commodities market. Those individuals and companies hedging or speculating in the commodities market bid prices based upon their judgments concerning supply and demand. If they do not see immediate and decisive action to increase supply from reserves in the face of reductions from the Middle East, they will bid up the price to untold new highs, and our economy cannot take it anymore. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity before you to appear before you. I'll be pleased to respond to any questions. Members of the committee, thanks you. The chair is going to recognize members for questions, starting with the gentleman from Indiana, Chairman of the Subcommittee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, we've been intending to have you folks uh, testify before us last fall and didn't get the opportunity because of the Clean Air Act, but been interested uh, because attention has been uh, turned to the commodity markets, as you know, the futures markets, uh, uh, with questions being raised as to whether uh, the tendency is for that to cause the price to go abnormally high or not, and you heard Mr. Mr. Merlis uh, express a concern uh, with the uh, possibility in the commodity markets need watching. Let me, uh, uh, there have been various critics of this. Uh, let me ask you uh, more directly, if, if we were not to have you folks in operation, uh, either permanently or, or for a temporary period of time, what are the consequences of that? If we were to truly suspend, if I understand your circuit break it, breaker uh, 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 propositions, they're really very temporary. I mean, they're for an hour, two hours, or something of that sort, not for two days or five days. Is that correct? I mean, that's... Yes, uh, the, the plan calls for an hour suspension of trading uh, and then a resumption of trading with an additional price limit, which follows that of $7.50. What, what is the, the consequence you see from the public's point of view, the pricing point of view, uh, uh, into operation of the market if you were to be suspended for a much longer period of time? Uh, I think there would be very adverse consequences. What's the public purpose in your existence, in a Certainly. sense, I'm asking? Uh, <clears throat> one of our public purposes, one of the main public purposes, is price discovery. It is, it is beneficial to uh, the industry overall and to the economy overall to be able to discover the true price of a commodity at any one moment in time. Uh, one of the elements of that is to have competitive price discovery. That is a way to focus all elements of the industry uh, in a forum so that all elements of the industry can determine the price through the bid and the offer process. Um, if we were to close the futures markets for an extensive period of time, be it three days, five days, a month, uh, 
or conceivably permanently, I think there would be irreparable damage in a couple of areas. First, we would lose that uh, price discovery function, um, although transactions for the product would still continue to go on in the cash market. That creates a much uh, less competitive situation. It creates a situation where uh, the ability of uh, large uh, oil companies or, or producing nations or the like to have leverage over uh, those who are smaller and, and uh, less able to acquire production for their operations. Uh, there's also the possibility, and I think it's a very real possibility, that you could have uh, a financial catastrophe. Much of the transactions that we see today uh, for purposes of the acquisition of oil or the refining of oil or even the distribution of oil are many related transactions between financing arrangements and risk management programs, whereas if you remove one of the legs that, that is holding up all of the components of particular transactions, the transaction itself loses its financial viability. So as today, for instance, a transaction where bank financing is, is received based upon a hedge agreement, if the hedging position is removed or unable to be traded, then that financing uh, will not be able to be obtained and also the risk on that position may then become disproportionate to the financing that has already been uh, obtained. So I think the, the consequences would be dire and, and do believe in addition that uh, closing the futures market for any appreciable period of time other than for information flow purposes uh, is, is, is highly unnecessary. The market will continue to trade during those period of times not only on other uh, international exchanges, such as the one in London or the one in Singapore, but also through the cash market mechanisms that are very viable today and will continue to trade. So those people who are making decisions in the futures market that we see reflected momentarily, each moment uh, throughout the day, are going to be making those same decisions in the cash market and doing those same transactions but without a risk management tool. That would lead, we would think, to uh, probably a much greater jump in prices uh, than would otherwise be seen if the futures markets were open. In other words, a trader, <clears throat> somebody who has to purchase or whatnot, or who is involved in this, might have more difficulty getting financing because they could not demonstrate that they could hedge their position and protect it therefore either would have trouble getting finances or have to pay at a higher rate to get finances. Uh, I mean, am I, I don't want to read too much into this. Are you telling me that, that basically this helps reduce some risks and some costs as a result? And secondly, that when you're able to do that, you can give greater assurance that more people can be a part of this process and not just those who have the large financing or the corporate structure or the assets to back them up. I mean, is that I, I would agree fair? with you, Mr. Sharp. Uh, I think we can almost equate risk with cost under the scenario that we're, we're dealing with right now. The greater the risk, uh, the less willing one is to uh, lock themselves into a transaction at the lowest possible cost, that there will be, the, as we've seen even in the war risk premium, the greater the risk of a disruption or the decline or fall of the price of the commodity, the greater the price will be because that risk has to be worked into the price. The market becomes less efficient and uh, I think we also see that uh, during that period of time the large uh, are able to uh, control much the way the, way the cartel many, many years ago was able to control price until competition, competition was, was introduced to the market. We saw the decline of prices uh, when supply and demand was, was more and more introduced to the market during the 80s, and the economy, I think, benefited uh, greatly from the reduced energy costs. However, it sent a fa false signal to us, obviously, that, that that energy was always going to be as easily acquired uh, for those low prices. And, and I think we've seen in the current situation that that, that assumption is, is just not true. And I take it your, your um, rules now that you've put into place that leave the possibility of suspending trading for temporary period of time, is that designed in hopes of 
correcting misinformation in the marketplace? I mean, uh, let's suppose that, you know, somebody has heard somewhere that there's been a big fire or there's a disaster or something that will tend to trigger people's responses. Uh, I mean, that, it seems to me, has the, the utility of at least allowing a, a, a short period of time in which people can hopefully get a more accurate reading on what's really going on rather than just what is complete rumor, though I'm sure you're always working with rumor no matter what. Uh, am I wrong about that? What, what, what utility is that? I'm trying to, to figure out uh, if you argue that it's not wise to suspend in the long run, what is the wisdom of the, the, the short suspension? Uh, it, it is primarily the, the purpose that you just stated. Uh, clearly, uh, there has to be an understanding of what is rumor and what is fact, and we hope that uh, the time limit or the, the time break in trading. I hope in you're trading. a hell of a lot better at figuring that out in your marketplace than we are here, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I think, and I'd like to distinguish a little bit between fact and rumor. Uh, we, we often read in, in, in the papers that rumors have moved the market on a certain day, and there's different attributions as to what the rumor might have been. Uh, but we also see facts in the papers every day. When we see our president or we see the, the prime minister of England uh, speaking about uh, the potential for war, speaking about the dire effects of that, uh, that's not a rumor. It's not necessarily an economic fact, but it does have economic consequences. That will be worked into the price of the commodity. On the other hand, there are often very short-term uh, pieces of information that, that uh, new services put out very quickly that can have an effect on the market, much like that other effect that I was just talking about, but uh, they are really unknown. The, the substance of the story or, or the ability to uh, understand the story, uh, we sometimes need some time to work that into the market. So we hope that this, this break will allow uh, those who trade the market to uh, acquire some understanding of the information, uh, to, to give a better grounding to it, and also to work uh, that information into their own supply and demand picture. Um, and we do believe that it will have a beneficial effect overall, that the, the greater the knowledge of the trading public when using a market, probably the better the decisions made at any one time. Mr. Chairman, I, I see my time has expired. I didn't know if any of the other participants on the panel, uh, I, Mr. Merlis or Mr. DeBone, particularly, might I'd, want to I'd like to agree. on the uh, commodity market and its significance or dangers. I, I'd like to agree with Mr. Thompson. I think it's much better to keep the uh, view or of, of what's going on in that marketplace within the United States than to have it uh, done in Singapore and uh, London or uh, in Rotterdam Harbor. And I think that to take some precipitous step and result in a loss of uh, the control of any f sort by the United States government or Congress uh, would not really be uh, in our best interest. So much as uh, uh, we are all uh, uh, subject to the swings of that marketplace, it's uh, better to have it uh, within your own confines than be far removed from it. Better chance to know what's going on, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mr. Devon, I don't know if you had a comment on it. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time and gentlemen, has expired. Gentlemen from Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd first like to ask the panelists, uh, each one, uh, what their perspective is on what would be a best-case scenario. We've talked a lot about the worst-case scenario with the other panel. Uh, let's assume that, um, uh, and we all hope and pray that this happens, that in fact Saddam uh, does back out, leaves Kuwait. Uh, pulls out uh, unconditionally as the President has uh, demanded and the United Nations has demanded. Um, what effect uh, will a still strong Saddam have, uh, despite the fact that he's pulled back within his own borders, uh, in terms of the uh, long-term uh, effect on oil prices? If, if that best scenario takes place and, um, and that happens, you're still going to be faced with a Saddam who has, has already uh, shown that he can use uh, brute force uh, and invasion. Uh, he's already shown that he has the wherewithal and perhaps the continuing ability to increase his arsenal uh, and his threat. Uh, what effect is that going to have? Let me start with Mr. Thompson because obviously you in many ways are on the cusp of that as it relates to the futures market. 
Uh, and uh, if that best case scenario happens, uh, what are your projections as to what might happen with the cost of crude in the world? Well, uh, with the caveat that nobody really knows the answer to the question, uh, I would say that I think a very positive and, and quick step such as you described uh, would have a very beneficial effect on the price. I would not hesitate. Short term? Short term and potentially long term. It will take some time to understand the, uh, the security of, of what has actually occurred. But assuming that, that a pullback occurs and, and there are uh, peace discussions of some nature, uh, again, on issues that, that may be very broad or, or very narrow, I think the market itself uh, would react very positively to that. I, could, I would hesitate to, uh, to predict at what level, but we have seen that uh, throughout time, the, over this period of time of six months, as more positive information has been assimilated by the market, we have seen a lessening of the war premium that was in the market very, very early on. Uh, I think it's still presumed that there is somewhat of a war premium existing in the price today, um, and uh, I would expect that that would be fully removed uh, in a fairly short period of time if, if there was very positive action taken. Well, that's, a, I guess, a, a lot more sanguine uh, prospect than I perhaps had expected. I'd ask Mr. DeBona uh, what his views are on that. Well, I think I'd focus, <clears throat> I think I'd focus a little more on the longer run. Uh, implications of that. Uh, uh, if that happened, uh, you would worry about the nervousness with which the remaining um, states in that area would view this man who has substantial military capabilities and has demonstrated a willingness to use them. Uh, and so there would be some uh, nervousness uh, and uh, it may affect the way in which they behave. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, was cited by Saddam Hussein at the time that this uh, uh, problem started was that uh, the Kuwaitis were producing beyond the OPEC limits and therefore reducing the price of oil on world markets. Uh, uh, that point may be remembered by them. That's uh, that's with this a, fellow uh, sitting there with all that capacity, military capacity, the, uh, the consequence of that is that in the long run, uh, the world is going to become more dependent upon oil from that area. Even if we take very substantial uh, conservation steps in this country and other places, as we should, uh, there is no careful analysis that I have seen that does not show growing dependence upon uh, Middle East and oil fairly substantially. In uh, what percentage and, terms, uh, in your estimation, what studies have you seen and what would be the, the I've seen the seen DOE studies. I've seen studies done by independent academics. We have reviewed all of these. We've put them together. Um, all of these show um, growing uh, energy consumption, oil consumption, despite substantial conservation steps, despite substantial increases in mileage uh, of automobiles. We have done a number of uh, studies and reviews of other people's studies of the potential uh, for conservation. Uh, it's substantial, but it does not adequately uh, deal with that problem. Are you saying so, way above 50 percent? Reliance on foreign energy or foreign oil? Well, in this country, uh, we already are essentially at 50 percent, and we're headed higher because uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is that uh, we're not being permitted to look for the oil and gas where it's likely to be found, for example, in places like Anwar, uh, in places offshore. So uh, it, it, is, it is virtually certain that we will uh, be importing 60 70 percent of our oil uh, sometime in the next decade or so. Let uh, me press that, that if will, I can. That, that, that's, that's almost foreordained at this point. But we are not the only country which will be experiencing that kind of thing. And almost all of the uh, increased, a good part of that increased production and certainly increased dependency will be on that uh, part of the world. So to uh, 
have that situation uh, that you have postulated exist, uh, given those uh, demands, uh, is a, a potentially a real long-term problem. Let me ask you, uh, I'm sure you've probably done some studies um, or, or have seen some studies. Where would we be had we listened to the uh, Cassandras in the uh, 60s and the early 70s, had we not built the Alaska pipeline and uh, sought 20% uh, of our oil uh, needs uh, from Alaska, where would we be today in terms of our dependence on foreign oil? Well, a quarter of all domestic production is coming out of Alaska today. A quarter of it? 25%? 25% yeah, of all domestic oil production is coming uh, from Alaska. We're producing about 8 million barrels a day and 2 million is uh, coming down uh, the pipeline. Uh, so it's, uh, um, uh, you know, we, we cut domestic production by a quarter. It would add that much to, uh, that would add 12 percent to the uh, imports, I mean 12 percentage points, so you'd be uh, well over half. So it clearly points out, uh, as you indicated, the uh, uh, the obvious need to uh, continue to explore for domestic sources uh, of oil uh, from this country. And I don't think anything could be more clear to the uh, public and to this Congress uh, that uh, had we not had the courage and the foresight uh, to explore and develop uh, oil resources from the north slope of Alaska, that we would uh, probably be supine right now uh, with uh, Saddam Hussein standing on our throat. Had enough as it is now, but had we listened uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the voices of darkness uh, back then, uh, I, hate, I hate to think where we would be today as a country, and indeed as a free world, uh, if we were under that kind of a situation. I appreciate your yeah, comments. I think you can testimony. put it in context by say, saying that the oil that's coming from Alaska through the pipeline is equal to half of the total loss to the world to the uh, as a consequence of closing the production out of Iraq and, uh, and Kuwait. Uh, so it's a very, very substantial thing. The thing that must cause people concern is that that field is currently in decline. It will go into much more rapid decline over the next uh, several years. And if we do not choose to uh, open the field to the east of it, that would be uh, the Anwar, the potential in Anwar, uh, we uh, will be in the position you describe uh, by the uh, end of the century. Mr. Chair, if I could just ask one more question, if I could beg your indulgence. On, on those same lines, if we were to approve the exploration in Anwar today, assuming that there's oil there, and that's still making an assumption, Assuming that there is oil today, how soon would we get the first drop of oil from Anwar? Well, even with an expedited program, it would be uh, eight to ten years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, welcome all the witnesses here, uh, particularly uh, Mr. DeBoner and the gentleman from uh, the Energy Department up in my home state of New York, and I want to uh, welcome the others as well. Uh, Mr. DeBona, we were talking uh, in response to the gentleman from Ohio, a very good question, because undoubtedly there will be an effort once again in this Congress to pass legislation that would open up ANWR, at least for uh, expiration. I would assume your industry would strongly support that. That is certainly correct. And the fact is that the North Slope uh, fields uh, have reached their zenith and are now beginning the downturn. Is that not correct? That's correct. I mean, there have been some very uh, extensive expense, uh, expenditures this year to try and hold the uh, production because of what's going on uh, in the Mideast. Uh, it was already in decline. Uh, those extraordinary measures have been taken. They're generally for uh, 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 pushing gas back into the field. Uh, but about a billion dollars is being spent to uh, hold the production. But uh, that doesn't deal with the long-term problem. Now, Mr. Gein, you are the uh, Deputy Commissioner of Policy and Planning Analysis for New York State Energy Office. Isn't it the fact that uh, Governor Cuomo's position is opposed to uh, exploring in the uh, Alaska wilderness lands? I really can't speak for him on that issue. And he, he's been opposed, has he not, to uh, 
offshore drilling in the Atlantic? I really can't speak to that point. I'm here representing the national. <coughs> I'm sorry. I really can't speak to either of those points. I'm here representing the National Association of State Energy Officials, and I'm not really uh, clear on the position with regard to that. However, the governor has taken the position that there should be a balanced national energy strategy, and I think that the point that um, might be made here is that in the development of discussion of production versus efficiency that we should have a balanced approach and it should be taken in a comprehensive manner. But you're not aware of his position against uh, the development of the Alaska wilderness for oil? And you're no. not aware that he has a position opposed to uh, offshore drilling? I'm not familiar with, it, with that Are position. Are you familiar with his position on uh, Shoreham? Yes, I am. Uh, you know that the Shoreham uh, nuclear plant would have displaced <coughs> Uh, someone oh, somewhere over seven million barrels a year of uh, imported oil, are you not? Well, it depends upon what would be online in the system at that point in time. The displacement is a function, really, of the replacement energy sources at that time. So it's a mix. Well, I think of it's the generally acknowledged system. that uh, if the Shoreham nuclear plant had been permitted by the governor to go online, 20,000 barrels a day of oil would have been uh, displaced, would not have been needed, so that the, well, the energy the policy of my state would appear to be, and you're complaining in your statement that we don't have a national energy mm -hmm. policy, uh, looking at the state energy policy, it is opposed to uh, uh, opening up uh, ANWR, it's opposed to offshore drilling, it's opposed to uh, uh, Shoreham nuclear power plant. So I'm just wondering, uh, uh, you know, it, it would appear to me to be a little inconsistent with, uh, with uh, some of the criticisms of uh, this administration and the prior administration that you level in your uh, statement. I think the point of the statement, which really represents all the states, is that we should have a balanced approach and it should deal with efficiency improvements. Okay, how's this for balance? Your last page. Page 9 at the bottom of the page, uh, is this a balanced statement? You say, uh, over dependence on imported oil and the lack of energy policy during the previous administration has led to the situation we are now facing here in the United States, period. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't include Saddam Hussein in there uh, at all, do you? You say we're, we're facing this energy crisis because of the lack of an energy policy during the previous administration? Yes, I do. You think that's a balanced statement? I think Would you like point, to correct that statement no, and give uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, Hussein a little bit of the credit for well, the energy he certainly, crisis? He certainly did lead to the discovery of the problem in a greater level than we would if he hadn't existed. But we certainly do have a problem of a balanced energy <laughs> policy in this country. Well, when uh, Iraq took out Kuwait, is it not the fact that uh, that 4.3 million barrels of oil a day were taken off the world market, at least at the, uh, immediately? Yes. And that's now been, uh, we believe, uh, somewhat offset. Well, I think it's been offset by production in the Persian, I mean, in the Persian Gulf. As and, prior uh, witnesses have stated. The production of the Persian Gulf has gone up, and production of Venezuela has gone up, and a number of other uh, areas have uh, increased production. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the situation with respect to, uh, um, Chairman tells me my time is up. Let me just finish the question. Isn't it the fact that we have an awful lot of oil in this country now that we have recovered from the 4.3 million barrel a day shortfall that was immediately caused by the fall of Kuwait? In this country? Yes. That the, and in the world? In the world, I, I think is your point. That most of that oil has come from the Persian Gulf. And the, my point is that there's great potential through increased efficiency to reduce the use of oil in the world which would help the situation. Have you figured out why the prices have uh, gone up since the uh, pre-invasion levels of, uh, 
of oil are now uh, substantially equivalent to what they were prior to the invasion? That as in your capacity as, uh, as uh, energy uh, deputy commissioner in New York State? Well, the supply situation now is very favorable. The real question is why are prices as high as they are? Yeah, and, and I'm as asking many of us have made the point that there is a war premium in the market, which has been a which has been applied to to not only the spot price but the wholesale price and the retail price, and that's led to the prices being where they are. My time is up. I thank the gentleman. Time, the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much, Mr. Debona. What do oil geologists believe is the percentage likelihood of finding oil in any uh, substantial uh, degree in the uh, ANWA? Well, uh, the probability of finding uh, uh, any oil is very high. There are differing probabilities for different volumes uh, of uh, oil. What is the probability, uh, the for probability example, of finding a uh, a two million barrel a day right. supply in the ANWA. What, what, what percentage would you put that at? I've forgotten the exact uh, number it, that uh, uh, to which this applies, but it's around a uh, 20 to 30 percent probability of finding uh, a quite substantial uh, volume of oil. It's higher. And for when you a, say a quite substantial, number. what are you? What I'm number? talking in the in the range you were talking about, two to three billion. It range. could. It, there is some probability of finding. Uh, over nine uh, billion, that is a field bigger than the uh, Prudhoe Bay field. But they've also had enormous uh, failures up there in trying to find oil, have they not? Uh, well, in this particular area, it is not, uh, it's not been explored except for one uh, well uh, drilled in the Eskimo village, and that, uh, that uh, the, the, the information from that is held by one company, which uh, which paid for that, and uh, that's not generally available. Uh, so, the, and you the 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 the, uh, the the wells that were drilled were in the Navy Petroleum, the old Naval Petroleum Reserve, which is to the west of uh, of Prudhoe. The structure uh, in the uh, 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 Anwar area on the coastal plain of the Anwar is uh, is similar and an extension of the structure in uh, Prudhoe. So the promise there is very high. This is an extremely high probability of finding oil in an area uh, which has not been uh, drilled. I, I mean, normally it's normally well, the what probability we're of about finding the, oil is much lower. What we talk about, however, when we talk about extremely high probability in terms of finding oil, mm -hmm. what we're talking about is usually a 15 to 20 percent chance at best Oh, or, else we, or else we would not have so many people who have been sitting on the sidelines, the wildcatters and others over the last decade, if they could have some certainty. And as we know, we've found many formations geologically that look like they would be highly desirable, but it turns out that the oil or the natural gas that was in them may have just seeped out yeah, you, a million or two years ago. And unfortunately, although the geologic formation did have a similarity, that in that particular instance it yeah, was Yeah, you don't empty. know until you drill. You don't That's know. I understand making, that. Right. So the point I'm trying to make yeah. is that, um, that uh, many people have gone broke uh, trying to find analogous um, geologic formations, which is why, to a certain extent, some people have gotten very rich. Some people have gotten very rich, and uh, and you represent those people. But the the the, uh, the the fact of the matter is, is that many, many, many others have gone broke, and it's because it is a crapshoot. It is, to a certain extent, uh, uh, a geologic. Uh, guesstimate that anyone is making at any particular point in time. And the only point that I would try to make at this point in time is that while we're waiting for this ho wish and a prayer to come to pass, perhaps we could try to find the energy uh, that we need by dampening demand, and that means by looking at technologies in other fields, which means automobiles, homes, appliances across this country and across this planet uh, that could immediately uh, begin to contribute to the lack of need for that energy uh, which may or may not be forthcoming from Alaska or any other place in the continental uh, United States. And, uh, and that would only be my message, that it's too thin a reed to place well, all should, of our hopes on. Uh, we looked at this pretty carefully. 
And uh, we think you have to do both of those things. Uh, neither one of them will uh, deal with this problem adequately. And if oil is not found there, there are other places where it may be found. The only uh, difference the that problem, I would, the only the problem, difference if, that, if you, you, you cannot save your way out of this problem. The only difference that I would make, though, is that yours is a, a wish and a prayer, whereas the other is a guarantee. You know no, you're going to you know find uh, energy in energy efficiency. You know you're going to find uh, energy in windmills and, and the solar technology. It's there. It has to be improved. The other, though, uh, I think is still too speculative. And I hope with the You don't know that you'll find break it down less cost. The, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman has expired. Um, further questions? Gentlemen, the uh, chair and the committee thank you for your very helpful assistance to us. We appreciate your presence, and we thank you for the information which you've given. It may be necessary for us to communicate with you for additional in, uh, materials or with regard to additional questions to the record, but we know that you will cooperate. We thank you. It's a pleasure to have you before the committee. Thank you all, gentlemen. Next panel is a panel of Mr. Edwin Rothschild, Assistant Director, Citizen Labor Energy Coalition, Mr. Philip R. Chisholm, Executive Vice President, Petroleum Marketers uh, Association of America. Uh, the chair notes that uh, Dr. Philip K. V Verliger, Jr., uh, Institute of International Economics, was to be with us today. Uh, the chair notes he has not been able to do so. So, Mr. Rothschild, Mr. Chisholm, if you will come forward, take your place. We will be delighted to receive your statement. And you may, you may select your own order for appearance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Ed Rothschild. Uh, it's the correction for the record. I am the Energy Policy Director of Citizen Action. There's been a, an organizational change, uh, just to keep that clear. Uh, we very much appreciate the opportunity to testify today on uh, some very important issues. Uh, I do want to present some promising news. Uh, as on my way up here, which is about uh, 9.30, as listening to CNN radio, uh, the Secretary of State and Foreign Minister Aziz uh, had a meeting. They broke for lunch, and apparently they had a sub subsequent meeting. Uh, as a result of all this positive news, the f oil futures market declined to about $23 a barrel. Uh, so, you know, in, in the event that um, peace breaks out, uh, we may be in for a, a nice surprise. In fact, the predictions are that oil could go down to $15 a barrel. That being said, I mean, the concern that I have, uh, in addition to the one if war breaks out, which we'll get to in a minute, is I hope that the pressure to produce policy on energy doesn't decline with the decline in price. Uh, I think one of the things that happened in the 1980s in addition to the failure of the Reagan administration to come up with a policy worth anything, in fact, they did much more damage on energy, is that we lost track of the issue and really are now in a position where we're far more dependent on imported oil and far more vulnerable to these kinds of disruptions. With respect to the possibility of an outbreak of war, I, I am fairly shocked by Secretary Easton's comments I mean, here we go into Saudi Arabia with over 400,000 troops, massive preparations, massive deployment, massive planning. And yet when it comes to getting a commitment to use our frontline weapon, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, there's, as um, one comment was, ho-hum. There's no commitment from the President of the United States to use the SPR, an early sustained basis. That just came from the Department of Energy which has all along supported use of the SBR, but was knocked down by the White House and other administration officials because it was not to be used to intervene in the marketplace, as if embargoing oil from Kuwait and Iraq was not an intervention of a massive scale in the marketplace. I mean, if you want to find a reason why oil prices skyrocket, it wasn't simply the fact that Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, which did trigger some increases, but the more substantial increases occurred after the United States led a worldwide embargo of oil from Iraq and Kuwait. At that precise moment, if you're going to make a policy like that, which was necessary, and don't get me wrong, I think it was necessary to create that embargo, but at the same time you take action to protect the U.S. economy and U.S. consumers. You don't let us be subject to the whims of traders in the futures market who are going to be driven by fear and panic about this supply disruption. 
and took the price to $40 a barrel and caused this country $22 billion in higher costs through this, uh, December of 1990. What the administration should have done, and listening to some members of Congress, some of whom clearly on this panel were calling for it, and other uh, economists like Phil Verlager, was to use the SPR. The administration did not, and the reason consumers are paying $22 billion, the reason the economy is being cost $22 billion, is because of administration policy failure. What the administration came up with, and I taught a class in junior high school on civics, and the thing the kids remember there was, oh, we should fill our tires with air. We got air from the administration on energy policy to make the tires run with less friction on the roads. Mr. Chairman, you uh, were one of the authors of the Energy Information uh, Agency administration, and I you know, want to point out one further step. They came out, by the way, with a study called Petroleum Prices. Uh, profits in the first 90 days. The study, they made a conclusion that said that we um, don't think there was profiteering in the industry. Well, there is data in that study that shows that the margins between the cost of crude oil and the price of refined products was higher in the third quarter than the third quarter of 1989. What happened to the refinery profits? Another EIA document says, well, there were higher refinery profits, but somehow uh, the marketing margins were lower. Well, there was no data presented. And this is their quarterly uh, financial reports that EIA puts out. No data. In fact, when they lowered marketing profits, it usually is the dealer that suffers, not the refiner. So one has to ask some questions, I think, to this study and, and why and how it came about. In my judgment, what happened was the Deputy Secretary of Energy, Mr. Henson Moore, asked for this study, gave the conclusions two weeks before it came out to the API's annual meeting, absolving the industry of any wrongdoing in pricing of oil. Of course, now in the fourth quarter, we're going to see 100 to 200, 300, 400 percent increases in the fourth quarter of 1990. Oil companies, which Chevron did two days ago, said, well, consumers don't have to worry. We didn't make it on refined products. We made it on crude oil. So I think a not, lot needs to be done in finding out how these reports get done and getting better information from the in Energy Information Administration. Uh, I do think, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that if there is planning for a war, you have to be prepared that all hell will break loose. Uh, Sheikh Yamani has estimated that war in the Gulf could drive market prices to $100 a barrel. The administration, which claims to believe in the market, somehow doesn't understand the market when it works. I think some people have made reference to the fact that when prices go up, that is a reflection of the shortage. You never will have a real shortage in the marketplace when price is determinant. It is the price that needs to be the trigger, and we have suggested that if a trigger me mechanism needs to be found, it's something on the order of price. That if price goes up, let's say, 25 percent over a, you know, several days, that that should begin to trigger someone's uh, concern about what's going to happen uh, in the marketplace, because the major function, it seems to me, of the SPR is to change the psychology. And unless you use it early and often, we're not going to be able to use it all. And if prices go up very quickly, you can be well assured that people in this room and outside of this room and all over the country are going to come right back here in Congress saying, you want something done about it now. And that means allocations. That means rationing. Because it's going to be rationing by price. And there are some people that can't afford oil and need it. Something's going to have to be done. And everyone's going to come here and ask that you do something to allocate supplies if in the, there's the event of an outbreak of war, because the acceleration of price will be self-fulfilling. People will hoard oil in anticipation of higher prices the next day. That hoarding in itself will take oil off the market and cause all sorts of disruption. Um, I will stop there and be happy to answer any questions at the uh, conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Rothschild. Uh, Mr. Chisholm? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm here today representing the Petroleum Marketers Association of America. PMAA represents some 43 state and regional associations throughout the country, uh, and through those state and regional associations represent some 11,000 independent small business petroleum product marketers. Collectively, these marketers sell roughly half the gasoline, three quarters of the home heating oil, and 60 percent of the diesel fuel that's consumed in the country. Our basic premise on being here today is we're concerned that the President lacks the necessary authority to deal with a severe energy interruption. A particular concern is the fact that Congress failed to approve the conference report of the Defense Production Act uh, last October before adjourning. 
Uh, it's interesting to note that in 1982, when President Reagan vetoed the uh, Standby Price and Allocation Control Bill that some members of this subcommittee worked very hard on, that he cited the Defense Production Act as all the authority he really needed in terms of dealing with an energy emergency. Now President Bush, going into January 15th, has neither the DPA nor any standby price and allocation control authority. Now in urging that the DPA be uh, approved expeditiously or reauthorized expeditiously, we don't believe that goes far enough. Our Board of Directors is taking the position that the, there ought to be enacted a standby price and allocation control program that would set on the shelf and that would be available to the President in the event of a future energy crisis. Now, that is not a popular uh, position, as you might imagine, within the petroleum industry. And from listening to the other witnesses this morning, I gather it's not a popular position for most people who have, who have testified earlier. There's two basic premises on which we base taking that position. The first one is, is that in the event of a real serious disruption and assuming the Defense Production Act is reauthorized and the President does instruct that certain refineries increase production of, of jet fuel or, or distillate fuel for military use, then that's going to create other disruptions throughout the rest of the system. And if there is no allocation authority uh, uh, to the federal government in connection with that, one of two things is going to happen. One is the refining industry, the major oil companies are going to decide how that product is allocated. And I can tell you from our experience in August and September, our members aren't comfortable with that. Sec or if that doesn't happen, and this comes to the second reason and the main reason we're supporting standby price and allocation control authority, that is the states will take that role and to take that responsibility. I was heartened to hear the uh, witness on the previous panel say that the states aren't really looking in that direction. Uh, but I am fearful that in the event of a very, very serious disruption, the political pressure will become so great, and as Mr. Rothschild said, citizens will not only be coming to you, they will be coming to the state legislatures and saying, we want something done and we want it done now. And it's been my experience that state legislatures generally react a little more quickly in those types of circumstances than the Congress does. I'm also concerned because the National Association of Attorneys General, in their recent report, has issued a model price gouging bill that is little more than a vague attempt at a price control, a permanent price controls in the marketplace. Now, this is not a random state or a random attorney general looking at this. This has been endorsed and recommended by the National Association of Attorneys Generals. And unless there is some authority at the federal level to preempt the states from being involved in these types of activities, I am fearful that in the event of a serious supply disruption, we will end up with a patchwork of state price and allocation control programs. Now, we certainly recognize that price and allocation controls or standby price and allocation controls are not the only way to deal with the crisis. In fact, we urge that they be the last step and we really hope that they're never implemented. And if they are implemented, that they're in place only for a very limited period of time, 60 or 90 days with a definite sunset provision. We support the aggressive use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We agree with the other witnesses that had the reserve been used aggressively uh, in August and September that we might not have seen prices rise as high as, as, as they did. And we hope that the President, not just Secretary Watkins, but the President will aggressively use the reserve in the event of, of, of a severe interruption. We remain concerned about the tremendous price fluctuations on the result of the Merck. Uh, we have supported a study of how the Merck operates and what reforms may be necessary in the operation of the Merck. We would recommend, however, that we move very cautiously in terms of suspending trading or taking certain products off the Merck. The Merck has provided a window for everyone to see how petroleum prices get set, and that has been a very effective tool for everyone over the course of the past uh, eight or nine years while the Merck has been, has been uh, engaged in that. Our final point, Mr. Chairman, is that we urge that any government action that's taken, any type of planning that is, that is made, recognize the residual impacts that a given action will have throughout the rest of the system. And one example I would cite is when President uh, Bush called on August 8th for the major oil companies to restrain retail gasoline prices. That was, in effect, a government intervention in the market because the industry did, in fact, respond to that. They did, in fact, restrain retail gasoline prices. They let wholesale gasoline prices rise, though. And wholesale pr gasoline prices continue to rise almost unabated. As a result, 
the people who were buying at wholesale and trying to compete with many of the major oil companies at retail were facing a significant competitive disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage that existed for almost 60 days. It's fine to take a philosophical bent that we don't want the government involved in, in, in this business, but the government gets involved in a number of ways. It gets involved when it embargoes 4 million barrels of oil a day. It gets involved when it asks for price restraints from the refiners. It can get involved in any number of ways. Whenever it does that, it's going to have residual impacts throughout the rest of the system. We think those residual impacts have to be looked at and have to be considered in whatever contingency plan that is developed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be happy to try to respond to any questions that you may have. Mr. Chisholm, the committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Sharp, Chairman of the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure I have a question immediately related to the topic of our hearing, which is the uh, actions to take now on an emergency basis. We've had uh, many communications from both of our witnesses who have been help very helpful to us over the years. Um, but I did want to ask about the, the recent experience, uh, Mr. Rothschild alluded to it and, and Mr. Chisholm as well in his testimony as to what, what happened in terms of who was making the bucks and what part of the industry was being squeezed out. Uh, and to what degree was there, uh, Mr. Chisholm, among members of your organization or other similar organizations, were there people who didn't have their own crude supply, obviously, and who, uh, whose margins might have been squeezed uh, at the um, marketer's level or the uh, filling station level? Um, d what, I'm not sure what the pattern has been in terms of uh, whether we've actually seen an, in, a dramatic increase in bankruptcies among those folks or whether they've been able to hang on uh, during the, the time that uh, the squeeze was on. There, there, there were a few closures. There were a number of service stations closed in, 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 in particular markets. Uh, I think what happened was there was a 60-day period from about August 3rd till early October when uh, there was a tremendous squeeze on any independent in the, in the marketing industry. Uh, that squeeze resulted, as I said, from the rise in wholesale prices and not a commensurate rise at the retail level. Uh, the the uh, differential between what is the wholesale price of gasoline and the retail price of gasoline at one point narrowed nationally to three cents a gallon in, in August. And I don't know of any marketer who can survive on three cents a gallon uh, for very long. There were a number of markets, and in fact, there were several press reports where our members actually drove their transport trucks into service stations to fill up because they could buy gasoline cheaper at that service station than they could from their own supplier at the terminal. Uh, so, so that was a very serious problem. Since October, the situation has reversed itself a little bit and we've seen wholesale prices fall. Retail prices have not fallen as quickly. Uh, some of that has been an effort to try to recoup what was lost uh, during, during that period of time. Uh, but the, the, the serious concern that our members have, aside from the profitability issue in regard to that, is for the first time the major oil companies, in their view, did not respond according to market forces. Market forces would have dictated retail prices to rise significantly more than they did. But they, but they showed, the major oil companies showed an ability to restrain that. And we're concerned about that ability and concerned structurally what that means for this industry. Mr. Rothschild, did you have a comment on that? Um, well, I, you know, I think it's interesting to look at some of the, uh, the actual numbers. We now have numbers from the Energy Information Administration through September from the Petroleum Marketing Monthly. Um, and, for example, we can see there's a chart three in testimony. Refiner margins in 19, every month in 1990, except September, were higher than in every month of 1989, the comparable months. <coughs> And it's particularly important in view of the fact that April, May, June, and July of 1989 reflected the impact of the Exxon Valdez price increase when the margins went up and the profits of the companies went up, <coughs> that the margins for refiners were much higher. I think that the companies did show some restraint for a period of time, a short period of time, uh, during uh, a period in, in September, uh, early October, but since October, and there's another table at least that, that tracks, we're not tracking the real prices here, we're tracking spot prices both for crude and for uh, spot gasoline, there's been a drop-off in price 
and yet, and a fairly rapid one, uh, and yet retail prices have not fallen off. So I think uh, Mr. Chisholm's remarks that companies are trying to uh, get back some of what they lost at the retail level uh, probably is true because the, the gap between wholesale prices and retail prices has widened. I mean, the key question that we need to answer and for which the Department of Energy does not collect information is what's happened on the dealer tank wagon price, the price that dealers get, versus the refiner rack price, because refiners have two wholesale prices because they market gasoline in different ways. That when the spreads between those, which are normally, I don't know, three, four cents a gallon, uh, between dealer tank wagon and rack, uh, when those go up, that means that the refiners are charging their dealers much more than they are at the wholesale level at their refinery. And I think some of that probably happened. This is what happened in 86 when the price of crude came down and retail prices didn't follow. Uh, the other concern we have about pricing is if you look between January and June of this year, the price of crude oil fell by $5 a barrel, but gasoline prices went up a nickel. So the oil, argument, the oil companies argue, well, gee, when prices go up, we have to buy replacement oil. That's why you're seeing the higher prices. Yet that doesn't happen on the way down. It didn't happen in, from January to June, and it didn't happen uh, subsequent to October. Finally, Mr. Chairman, you can look at the Department of Energy's uh, EIA's winter fuels report and see on heating oil that prices for heating oil, both the wholesale and retail level, skyrocketed. Wholesale prices have come down over 20 cents a gallon, uh, about maybe 26 cents a gallon, something in that order. But retail heating oil prices have not come down about 13 to 14 cents since the beginning of October. So we have some concern there that consumers are paying much higher prices. The, the, the plus side is that it's been a warm winter thus far, and so people aren't using as much heating oil. Thank you very much. Thanks. Time the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Rothschild. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rothschild, you've been critical of the previous administration, and I think by inference the uh, present administration in regard to a lack of a national energy policy. Uh, have you come to the Congress uh, during those uh, 10 years or so and uh, sought a, a national energy policy to be uh, crafted by the Congress? We have on periodic occasions called for various policies. We have not called, uh, I'm trying to recall all the testimony in those years, for a uh, comprehensive policy, but we supported uh, policies over the period of time that would have made this country less dependent on foreign oil, uh, policies that have promoted energy efficiency, for example, alternate fuels, increases in the DOE budget that would have promoted more uh, research and development of these processes, which have a huge return for our economy, which have a huge return in terms of uh, um, industrial growth, yeah, we, we, we've testified periodically about some very policies, so not necessarily for a national energy strategy, comprehensive policy, but various proposals. Isn't it true that the Congress does, of course, have the ability to uh, craft its own national energy policy and uh, take the lead uh, if it so chose? Yeah, well, Congress also had the opportunity to do something on clean air, but it found it very difficult when the President of the United States decides that he doesn't want a clean air bill and it makes a big difference that the President of the United States is also committed. Clearly, Congress can do that. It is much better for Congress to move ahead when it has the support, at least partially, of a president who wants something to happen on a particular policy area. Would you plan on supporting the uh, energy policy that the president will be sending up to the Hill? I'd like to see it first. From what I've seen, it's uh, being ripped to shreds uh, uh, every time it uh, goes to the White House, it goes to the en uh, Economic Policy Council, or it goes to John Sununu and on the testimony. I well, it just seems to me it's, it's a little inconsistent to attack an administration for not having energy policy and then to trash it for at least uh, making an attempt to try to come up with a, a consensus energy policy. Well, I don't think they're trying to come up with a consensus energy policy at all. I think that was the initial effort of the Secretary of Energy, and I think he's been sandbagged by people in the White House like Sununu, like Darman, uh, who don't want, I mean, they have this ideological perception that you shouldn't intervene in the marketplace. Well, how, do you, how do you know that? Do you read in the Washington Post or what? Well, I read some of the papers that come out of the Department of Energy. I read some of the papers that come out of the Energy uh, Economic Policy Council. There are people that talk at the Department of Energy. There are people that talk in the White House. I mean, word does get out. Did you support the uh, Carter Energy Policy? Some parts of it. The parts that have been repealed since or? Uh, let's see, where, where do you want to start? Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> give me a good one. Well, I think some of the, uh, we, we, we talked about it uh, earlier, I think Mr. Markey made, made mention of some of the, uh, the policies. Um, I'm sure that, 
for example, on um, Fuel Use Act. Uh, I don't know where we were. We, you know, the, the, the Carter policy was a mixed bag. We were critical. Uh, let it be told that the record's there. We were critical of, uh, for example, uh, Carter efforts to decontrol natural gas. I think Mr. Tingle will remember the many, 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 many hours and months that were spent on crafting a bill. Uh, so various uh, constituencies supported different parts of the Carter initiative. I mean, we certainly were very supportive of the solar initiatives, of the conservation initiatives uh, in those areas, but we didn't support every piece of the Carter uh, package. Did you, uh, did your organization uh, support the uh, exploration and uh, drilling uh, in Prudhoe Bay? My uh, organization didn't exist when that issue was being debated in Congress. Um, so I can't, you know. How about you personally? I personally, I, I think the question that I had was not the actual drilling of oil in Prudhoe Bay was the way to bring it into the United States. The debate that we were involved is with whether you have a system that goes through Canada or goes, which would probably have been far more convenient for the rest of the country as opposed to dumping it all on the West Coast. I mean, the problem with dumping all on the West Coast is that you have to tanker it through the Panama Canal to get it to the Gulf Coast. And a far more intelligent way was bringing it through Canada, but some people were afraid that the Canadians might, might behave like Saddam Hussein and seize the pipeline or something. So uh, that was the debate we were involved in. Not well, there was also some, some environmental concerns by the we Canadians. Were, we're not, we were not involved in the environmental debate at all. I was not. Well, but th that was a fact, was it not? Oh, there was an environmental debate, yes. yes. People wanted to be built in a way that didn't affect the you know, environment adversely, and I think some of those debates helped to build a better pipeline. If they had built the pipeline as originally proposed, it probably would have melted most of the tundra. Uh, <laughs> not to mention the caribou. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, where, what is your uh, organization's position on ANWR? Uh, we have not taken a position on ANWR. We are not quote unquote, one of the environmental organizations. I mean, when Understood. we get into the environmental issues, like on toxic waste, it's because of the effect on human health. When we got into the debate on clean air with respect to automobile um, um, fuels, it was be, uh, it, with respect to the impact on human health. So we have not gotten into the debate on ANWR uh, at all. We have not taken a position one way or the other. Now, what is the title? What is your title? I'm the Energy Policy Director. Energy Policy Director, but yet you don't want to take a position on ANWR? Do I want, I said our organization, you're asking me, I have an organization that I represent. Understood. The organization, as far as I know, I've not been told that we've taken a position on ANWR. Well, will you be... Uh, would you uh, like me to find out what our position... That would be, be uh, interesting. And next time you come back, uh, okay. we can have a discussion. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, gentleman from New York, Mr. Lent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chisholm, I just have one or, one or two questions. Uh, your statement on the uh, third page indicates that you have now gone on record as of October last calling for uh, enactment of legislation, standby price and allocation control bills, similar to that vetoed by President Reagan in 1982. I think that's a bill that probably emanated from, uh, from this committee. Was the PMAA in favor of that legislation at that time? It was, sir, and it was in favor at that time, and we urged President Reagan not to veto it, and we urged the override of the veto unsuccessfully. Has uh, PMAA changed its position or its emphasis on this general subject in recent history? What happened, uh, uh, Mr. Lent, was after the Isla versus Puerto Rico decision, which opened the door for state price and allocation control uh, uh, laws at a state level, we went back to our membership in 1986 and asked them, do you want us to pursue some type of preemption of state law? We talked to a number of congressional staff uh, people who told us that the only way we could achieve a state preemption is if the federal government did something in its place and that the federal government would have to have some program uh, in order to preempt the states from doing it. At that time, we advised our membership of that, and at that time, the issue wasn't of critical concern to them to push it. What has happened in the course of the last uh, uh, six months has prompted them to reconsider that and once again urge us to continue to, to, to push that particular piece of legislation. And that, would, that legislation with respect to the question of preemption or federal uh, preemption, are you in favor of that? Or We're in favor, favor of federal preemption. Over the state. 
Yeah, the thing controls. that concerns us most is a patchwork of state price and allocation control bills or state pricing laws or allocation laws that will distort the whole system. Now, those type of controls, uh, price and allocation, did not work particularly well back in the 1970s. Uh, in fact, they backfired. What makes you think they're going to work in 1991? Uh, that's a good question, Mr. Lent. Uh, our members were as much of the victims of those price and allocation controls as anyone. We were one of the advocates of having them removed. I think one of the things that when people look at the 70s that they forget sometimes is those controls went on for a specific purpose in 1973. If they had been taken off late in 1973 or early 1974, you wouldn't have the same memory of them that you now have. What happened is you had the distribution patterns it, that existed in 73, 74, determining allocations for 76, 77, 78, and 79. So when the Iranian crisis hit in 79, you were trying to allocate supplies based on 73 and 74 demand patterns, and it just didn't work. It was a nightmare. What we think can happen is that in a severe emergency, you can have something that's a quick hit, that's in place for 60 or 90 days, and then goes out. The only the bill that was passed in 82 had a clear sunset provision in it. And uh, that's the only way we would support something of that nature. Okay, I want to thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Mr. Chairman, if I could at this point belatedly ask unanimous consent to put my opening statement in the record at the appropriate Without place. Without objection, that will be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, we have kept you a long time. We are appreciative of your assistance. If additional uh, information is required, I hope you'll feel free to uh, uh, respond either on your own or to requests that might be made by the committee. Uh, the committee will stand adjourned until the call of the chair. That concludes this hearing of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Energy and Power. For more information on this hearing, you can write to the subcommittee at room 331, House Annex 2, Washington, D.C., 20515. Coming up next, a look at the players in the Persian Gulf region, followed by today's Geneva News Conference with Secretary of State James Baker. Good evening from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN 2, our nonprofit cable satellite public affairs network.